Hello, friends. Welcome. I'm seeing the comments coming in. Let's do some hellos before we properly kick off. Uh, Shanann, thank you. Hello. Happy Monday. Uh, Wendy, I am I am pleased that your Monday is made happier by my presence. I am uh, worried that you lost a day this weekend. I hope it was for a, a good reason, uh, that you're not just missing one. Um, hello, Catherine. Your first live stream, Makeup Maven. Well, I will try my very best to make it a good one. Welcome. Hello. Oh, well, I mean, it's dark currently, so I don't, Shropshire may or may not be rainy because it is night time. We are at, we've just gone half past eight in the evening here on Monday. And uh, is that Hanan? Hanane? Oh, welcome. Um, for a first one too as well lovely and we've got Deborah hello and Shane hello hello oh we had a little jump there Carol from New Mexico lovely to see you thank you for joining from LA thank you Hadrian for coming in um Good afternoon or morning or evening, whatever time it might be for you. And if you are watching this on the playback, welcome to the playback. If you've joined us live, thank you very much for making the time to come down. Right, so I'm just going to, we have a lot of news. I'm seeing some, hello everybody coming in. Um, welcome to this live. We are, of course, talking about the history news from the last week. Now, I just want to flag up that I got a bunch of news items sent to me late last night and today. So if you did send me something yesterday or today and it's not in this live stream, then it means one of two things. Either we've already spoken about it or I'm going to talk about it next week. So one of those things have happened. So that if you don't see yours come up today, then I do apologise. It will be coming up either next week or we've already chatted about it. We do have lots of news to get through. We have uh, updates, repatriations slash decolonisation. We have new news. We do have some ding dong and we also have some events and exhibitions and I'm now that's broadening out so we have got some things like online events which we've had before but also things like book launches and news about things that are going to be opening in a few years time the section is maybe feeling a bit untidy at the end uh, it may be a case that we have to figure out a different way to do that but we shall see Alberta Thank you so much for the super sticker. That's incredibly kind of you. Um, and I've, I've not done anything yet. I've just been waffling at you for the past three minutes. Um, thank you very much. I, Shanann, I can close, I can turn on closed captions after the live stream has happened, I believe. I don't think it ha it can do it live. So I think it can, it can play back potentially and closed caption it afterwards. And I will certainly do that. But to my knowledge there is no way of it doing it live if i am incorrect there i will do the settle wait no the setup <laughs> i will set it up next time in a way that does that but as far as i'm aware it has to be um done afterwards so let me first of all begin by saying i'm going to say my thank yous we do this time have a working opera pin board so we have all of the links in the opera pin board pin board we also have all of the links linked in the description box. And on top of that, I have numbered the slides you're about to see. So those numbers on the bottom of the slide correspond and coincide with the numbers in the description box. It all makes sense in my brain. When we do get to events and exhibitions, if we are talking about a museum or a place which you have to go to, then I have found the accessibility information and I have added that to the opera pin board and also to the description box so it is there for you and in the cases that we're talking about today they did all have accessibility information uh, that where appropriate so they will be put in front of your very eyes right we're going to start as per usual with the thanks and then we're going to move straight in so let me add this to the stream wonderful i would like to thank adventures from shallot amy Verity, Joseph, Tara, maybe Tira, Sherry, Carve Felum, Kate, Mary, Yvonne, 
Joe, Maggie, Carolyn, Jesse, Elaine, and Crazy Artist Lady. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to send me news items. It really does. I'm so chuffed every time people take the time to do this. It does mean ever so much. And I've just spotted, Jared, you've started early. You, you're talking about bringing your drink. Now, as per usual, this is never a drinking game. I don't think we've got many ritual purposes popping up in this one, but we do have Ding Dong and other regular nonsense that we tend to talk about as happening in the news. So this is never going to be a drinking game. I will never approve that message. But you are, I assume, mostly grown-ups. I, I certainly hope so. Uh, although this is a PG-13 scenario, it is not made for children. And um, considering what things are getting banned currently in certain places, I don't know if the stuff that I'm talking about is possibly illegal in some states. Who knows? So uh, behave yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pretty pick. Not a drinking game disclaimer. Take a shot. This is now then. I'm going to discipline you with my waggy finger. <laughs> Naughty. Very good. Um, coffee is fine. As long, I don't have too much coffee for if you have that many. I believe it's a diuretic. You'll dehydrate yourself. You'll be a husk of a human being. <laughs> Viewer discretion is advised. To a certain extent, I try to be as PC and no, as PG thirteen as possible, which sometimes is hard for me because there are things that happen that make me want to swear like a navvy. But uh, it is PG thirteen. However, I cannot be held responsible for the nonsense that makes itself into the news. That isn't me. Someone else has done that. Um. Brian, I'm not going to do one of those on, on live. Um, so I it, it, it certainly is illegal everywhere, I believe. <laughs> so uh I'm not going to do one of those though. So we're we're fine <laughs> on that front. Let us begin with some updates. This is an update that made me smile. I have this on my iPad form to make it bigger. A Utah parent has said that the Bible contains and should be removed from school libraries. We have their full challenge in this article, which I think is... Oh, <laughs> there we go. Brian, you meant frequent topics. You weren't suggesting that I was going to stage <laughs> Lee Morton form of discipline, um, of legal kind. I don't even know what you can say, uh, which the algorithm won't flag you for. That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> I thought you thought we were going to get a uh, a reenactment. Um, yes, Melissa, I believe this. I believe this is somebody taking the proverbial Michael, if you will. I, from what I can see, so the challenge we hear in the article: frustrated by the books being removed from school libraries, a Utah parent says there's one that hasn't been challenged yet, but but they they believe it should be for being quote one of the most sex ridden books around. They talk about the inappropriate content, including uh, incest, onanism, bestiality, prostitution, FGM, MGM, fellatio, dildos, sex without consent, and even infanticide. Thus, that, and they say the codes that they're citing is that is the one that Utah placed in 2022 to ban any books containing pornographic or indecent content from Utah schools, both in libraries and classrooms. And they they do have a point, don't they? It's almost like when you start legislating and removing free speech, there's other things that are going to get swept up in that. <laughs> As I as I think you're that spot on. It's not not true. So this paper, the the uh, Salt Lake Tribune, obtained a copy of the parents' petition for the book review of the Bible late on Tuesday after submitting a public records request for it on March the 9th, asking for an expedited response, which has been denied. The Davis School District did not respond to the Tribune's request for comment, but returned a call late on Wednesday. The plot, as they say, it thickens. The district spokesperson, Christopher Williams, repeated what he told other media outlets 
quote, we don't differentiate between one request and another. We see that as the work that we do. He said the Bible challenge, which sounds like a really weird fitness uh, regime that probably involves doing something for 40 days. The Bible challenge has been given to a committee for to review. It, and no point should somebody do the Bible challenge in a fitness regime. I beg of you, please. I've said it now and I regret saying it immediately because it'll give somebody the idea. The process typically takes 60 days. That's not very biblical. But William said the committee is not done with the request due to a backlog as more parents have been questioning books. Whoa. <laughs> uh, according to the copy of the request, this parent submitted their challenge on December the 11th, before even Jesus' birthday, would you ever. The district removed the parent's name, address and contact information, citing privacy reasons. Oh, no, they don't want this person to be hailed as the hero by the rest of the world. They almost certainly will be. They also attached to their request an eight-page listing of passages from the Bible they found to be offensive and worth reviewing. This is... It's not malicious compliance, but it's the version of malicious... It's its its the, this version of complaining that is malicious compliance, which I just enjoy so much. The request is specifically to remove the book from the shelves at Davis High School. The parent wrote, quote, get this porn out of our schools. If the books that have been banned so far are an indication for way lesser offences, this should be a slam dunk. Parent, we don't have your name, but you live in our hearts. In solidarity. I, I, I think that that's wonderful. Well done. Really? Oh yeah, I forgot. We, th I think they're a hero for being, um, for taking the Michael. Probably lots of people don't. I forget about that. I forget about that. So we have another um, update, connected update. This is I saw the video of this. The the AOC railed against Republicans during a House session, claiming that even the story of Rosa Parks was, quote, too woke for the GOP. I have come to absolutely abhor the term woke. I saw it in my comments um, as an accusation aimed towards me. And I, you know what, I'll be honest, I have now muted the word woke because I don't want to hear it. During And frankly, it's my comment section, so I can do that. I don't I don't mute a lot of things. I don't delete comments, but I don't want to see the word woke because I think it comes from a place of either failing to understand what being not woke actually looks like, or it comes from a place of somebody who I don't really enjoy conversing with. So there we go. During a meeting of the House on Thursday, Miss Ocasio-Cortez gave an impassioned criticism of the Republicans Parents' Bill of Rights Act. I think this is what we've been talking about and what has been informed to me last week, that parents, that if one parent complains about a book, there's shenanigans that that jumps in um, with this whole let's ban it thing. We say aims to give broad oversight to parents over the nature of the curriculum taught in school, the specific books available to children and the spending of schools' budgets. And I'm assuming this is when it only takes the one parent. Before they claim this is not about the banning of books and not about harming the LGBT community, let's just look at the impact impacts of similar Republican legislation that has already passed on the state level, she said. Look at these books that have already been banned due to Republican measures. One of the books she mentions is The Life of Rosa Parks. The book recounts the life of Parks, who refused to give up, famously refused to give up her seat on a bus to a white person at a time when black riders were forced to sit at the back of the bus away from white riders. She said that The Life of Rosa Parks, this is apparently too woke by the Republican Party. She likened the proposed legislation to fascism. When we talk about progressive values, I can say what my progressive value is, and that is freedom over fascism. The W word, let's call it that. Uh, yes, Madeline, thank you ever so much for the super sticker. I really appreciate it. It's very, very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so kind uh we're going to call it the w word because you can't now put it in my comments because i have muted it so if you say the w word i know what you mean um and we can move on from that or, or we could also do it like it's a swear word <laughs> which i also enjoy <laughs> fabulous <laughs> um yes i 
also the other one that I that was doing the rounds for a while was Snowflake. All right, fine. Just sounds like throwing around insults for for no reason. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's that's what annoys me. That's what annoys me about it is that it's used it's it's used by somebody as a way to demean and degrade somebody who has who is awake to social injustice and that that doesn't chime with my ideals. It doesn't I'm very I'm currently very big on protecting my peace and I it's not my it's not my job to um fix bigots it's not i i'm not going to have i'm going to do what i do i'm going to talk about this stuff online and you can come along for the ride and go away and do your own research and see what you think i'm not going to preach i'm not going to fix this i can't fix it i'm one person but i am going to stand on my morals and my ideals and i'm also not going to allow people to come at me and use petty ill thought out faux insults that to try and get to me based upon something that I'm actually quite proud of. Um, the other thing I mute is, and I block and delete is any reference. I don't mind people talking about, about my appearance, the makeup I wear, wearing my hair down, but I will not have any comment about the size of my body anywhere if i see it i will block and i will block and delete um because i don't care i choose to look the way i look i choose to shape myself in the way that i shape myself but i i block and delete because i know there are people who really struggle with their body image and their body and their identity in that way um so i block it so that comment section is a safe space it's absolutely unnecessary and uh, i i'm not here as a fitness influencer or a lifestyle vlogger or anything like that so my body and the way it looks is completely off limits for discussion um that is what i'm that's what i'm doing there we go just put that put that there uh beverly i have I, my favorite quote is that i will not set myself on fire to keep other people warm not going to do it no, thank you. Not not today, not tomorrow. <laughs> no. You're you're very you're very kind. Thank you, pretty pick. And um I I agree that my 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 body is perfectly Dr. Cat sized, um, because it is the size that it is, and it does incredible things like grow a person. Um and thus, there we go. Right, so back to um <laughs> what we were talking about we are on rosa parks and aoc in some cases the books aren't banned but altered this this i find i have issues with this because i know there was a discussion about altering role doll and that became a discussion about wokery actually what i think it was is that parents are choosing books for their children that have certain messages and they weren't buying roll doll particularly things like the twits or the witches because particularly in the twits there is a conflation of the an ugly inside being matched by an ugly outside and even though there is somebody who is then drawn who, who doesn't fit traditional beauty standards who is said to be beautiful because they're beautiful on the inside it's still very appearance heavy and put it this way i wouldn't buy that for my son to read uh, it, I, as a first choice, there's other books that I I want to have a, a look at. So that's I think why people are changing those books. But this is interesting that a school district removed references to Parks's race in a lesson plan centered on her story, which is a which is a weird a weird choice. Um, we have this thing called the Stop Woke Act, our new swear word of the day. That's Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis is a bad guy, isn't he? He is the bat. He is the he is the villain. I'm. Um, I don't know everything or uh, much about American politics, but he's the he is the bad guy. The state department of education later admitted removing her race from the lesson was wrong. Well, that's good of you. That's big. <laughs> that's big of you. Trying to educate children in Florida is becoming more difficult for teachers and staff trying to navigate the frequently changing state mandates passed down by Mr. Santis. Is he a teacher? 
has he ever been an educator or is he just somebody um, who is over entitled to stick and sticking his oar in when he has absolutely no frame of reference? <sighs> the mediocrity of somebody who doesn't know what they're doing is, but who is just filled with confidence. All of the confidence, none of the skill. Fabulous. Uh, a principal in Tallahassee was forced to resign recently because, because parents complained about a lesson for sixth graders that featured Michelangelo's David as well as other Renaissance artwork. One of the parents called it pornographic. If you were that parent, grow up. The school board chair, Barney Bishop, possibly a churchman with a name like that. Why not? Avid supporter of Mr. Santis educational agenda bragged that the school would be on the cutting edge of following the state's new guidelines. Quote, we agree with everything the governor is doing in the educational arena. We support him because he's right. Wing. Um, the, the whole woke indoctrination going on about pronouns and drag queens isn't appropriate in school. Everyone has pronouns. <laughs> Everyone has pronouns. That's literally how the language functions. I... <laughs> They don't know what a pronoun is, and it makes me really cross. They, they, they just. I'm not. When they say things like, "I'm not going to respect his pronouns," he can, he can be called what I tell him. I just don't. It makes me really upset because they don't know what pronouns are, and I just it makes me angry. And also, when we talk about drag and cross dressing, I would like them to meet the works of Shakespeare and also pantomime in this country. It's very odd to me that we're having this brouhaha over drag queens when literally every Christmas in theatres up and down the country, you will take your unfortunately behaved child into a theatre space, cram them full of sugar and watch a man play Widow Twanky and, and a girl play Peter Pan and scream, he's behind you. And also there's so much innuendo. It's, it's, it's wild to me, wild to me. Yeah, Rebecca, that's also a great point about Roald Dahl is that there is some very upsetting uh, anti-Semitism as well. So those, those, I think those books are being changed, not because of wokery, they're being changed and there's a desire to kind of clean up <laughs> the reputation um, because they aren't selling. <laughs> so publishers want to make money and people who have rights to the estate want to make money off of it and so if altering the language might make it more saleable they're going to do that sometimes woke is actually the profit motive let's just remember that we are in late stage capitalism friends <laughs> i've heard this that we don't have panto in the us it is really it's it's an odd i'm not going to say it's not an odd tradition but i love it and i cannot wait until my son is old enough that I can take him to Panto and I'm going to get him one of those like light up wands. We're going to buy just so much tat and he is going to be filled with chocolate. Uh, and it's, I'm going to regret my life choices straight away afterwards, but it's going to be delicious for him. I also can't believe the 2020s are, are turning actually scarier than being a child of the 80s. I, Alex, I don't know if you're if you're um, based in the UK, but I grew up in uh, in under Section 28, and that directly impacted my life um, because I. So, for those of you who don't know, Section 28 was essential was essentially a uh, conservative policy over here that was instituted by Margaret Thatcher and her ilk that said that you should not present homosexuality or same-sex relationships as a viable form of relationship or something equally heinous along those lines. Well, essentially, I grew up in a household and in a, in a family group and in a wider friendship circle of adults where there were gay people, lots of gay people. And so I came into school. My mother had told me how babies are made when I was quite young. And I had asked then how did gay men make babies? And she informed me they didn't. She did then also tell me how they express their physical love. And this was excellent information for four-year-old me. And so in my uh, school, all-girls school, sewing circle, it's one of those schools, age four, I did then proceed to tell my classmates what a homosexual was and how they express their physical love. Um, 
Which, granted, if you if you were a parent who hadn't told your child what sex was, that was possibly um <laughs> not something that you would have wanted coming home. Um, pretty Vic, I was in fact the original Timmy. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. I'm I was the original Timmy. So anyway, my mother got called up the school. I did. I absolutely did. My mother got. Called. I also told them. Is, is there any children around? If there's children around, I'm about to talk about the man who comes at Christmas. Cover is 54321, because apparently I found out the hard way as well that you shouldn't inform your classmates at four that um, St. Nick isn't real. Did that too. Um, so <laughs> that is, I did I did do that. And my mum got caught up at the school and her response, which is why I am the way I am, was, well, was she wrong? <laughs> And the headmistress went, no. <laughs> Do you think it's appropriate for a four-year-old? And she, my mother went, well, these things happen in the world. Perhaps everyone needs to grow up. <laughs> they were four. <laughs> they were four. Um, so, uh, but of course, one of the reasons my mother had to come up the school, had to be caught up the school, was because of Section 28. Because what I had done was in breach of Section 28. And had a parent complained and had the school not done a thing about it, then there could have been there could have been problems right then and there for that school. So um that is where we are on the updates. Can't believe we're 20 minutes in. We've got to get we've got to get motoring. I've just I've literally this was just confessional. I've talked about my the my war my personal war on woke, which is for the word, not the concept. I've talked about body related issues and now I've just outed myself as being a massive Timmy for those of you who don't know why I'm calling myself a Timmy that relates to something that I do with some friends of mine on a Wednesday evening it's called History After Dark it's where we don't go PG-13 we are on YouTube and Instagram and um, I swear like it's my job <laughs> so if you are brave and you want to see that side of me I apologise in advance. I'm disgusting um, and vulgar. But if that's the sort of thing that you want to witness, then come down on a Wednesday. I think we're going th on Thursday this week, though. But we go at quarter past eight. All of the information will appear. Um, follow us. See what you think. There we go. Right. <laughs> oh, well, I've just, I've, I've, I've just seen, I've just seen. You're upset not getting the peanut butter and cracker snack with the lunch. So you told the teacher that your mum abandoned the family and they beat me. You don't remember it, but the teacher reminded me. Wow, Brian, that's exceptional. That is the the that is amazing. <laughs> I bet your mum was well chuffed. I remember people asking me questions. You know, I'm going to move on in a second, but I'm just going to I'm going to. This has made me think of a a little story. Uh, Wheezy Squeezebox, the YouTube channel I'm talking about is called History After Dark. So if you, you will find us, I, in fact, I will, you know, I'll link it in my description after I finish this. So once we finished, come back to the description box. I will put History After Dark in there. You can find it there. So I, uh, Brian's comment reminded me, I didn't dob my mother in as a, as a, as a <laughs> flagrant child abuser however my face did um even though it wasn't her fault so i'm clumsy always have been my mom's worse but i'm i'm clumsy thank you dorothy mayfair that's it wonderful history underscore after underscore dark fabulous i will leave that up while i tell this story and then we will move on because we have to be finished at some point so the story goes <laughs> i was away on holiday with my family um, and I'd gone away with my grandmother and my aunt and uncle and my cousins. My mum had been there and then she had to go back to work. So I stayed up there in this house and they had this Rosewood music player and I fell over something. I think it was a toy and I fully cracked my face. And with, I'm about three. I cracked my face on this Rosewood music player and I must have had a concussion because my grandmother was icing my forehead and I was screaming about her beating me to death. So I think I was a little bit delirious. Anyway, I don't tell my mum because I don't want her to worry. <laughs> so when she picks me up, I have got, it looks like I've been hit in the face of the cricket bat. I have this just enormous bruise here and just two massive shiners. And I've got to go back to school. <laughs> and it wasn't the first time I've been injured. I fell off a wall and I bruised my the middle of my front teeth. So my baby teeth had like a black mark where I'd kind of 
killed the blood supply in the middle. Um, so I, uh, <laughs> they, I was asked how I'd injured myself um, <laughs> because they were worried that somebody was walloping me. But no, I'm just, um, I'm just, a, I'm just a clumsy. Clumsy, clumsy. Um, yes, Brian is, is following up that, <laughs> that Brian was not beaten, nor did Mother abandon the family. But without the peanut butter snacks, wasn't it like an abandonment? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, bigger Timmy is it's it's it can be Karen, it can be all nationalities. Timmy was essentially based on Tiny Tim, somebody really adorable who's learnt things and they know too much. Um, but so Timmy can be of all of all, all nationalities, but Timmy is a small child who gets their parents into trouble. <laughs> it's not related to the South Park thing. Timmy is not related to Timmy in South Park. Timmy, in my mind, is related to Tiny Tim, so really mm -hmm. adorable and vulnerable, but gets parents into super trouble. Super trouble. Right. Now then, we've gone on too long. We must move on to repatriations and decolonization. We're only on slide two. I need to get better at my job. <laughs> repatriations and decolonization. This is not Picasso's, but still precious. Museums are returning silver that was taken by the Nazis. German institutions began to give back cups, candlesticks, teapots, and other crafted silver items that Jewish people were forced to surrender during the time of the Third Reich. This is an incredible story. I'm just sharing a little bit of it here. Um, do check out the full story because it's got some incredible examples of things, various items going back and you get to meet their owners and talk about what they mean. But an example is the article starts in this way. It was noon on November the 10th, 1938, when Nazi officers came to the door of William Bergman's Munich home, arrested him for being Jewish, shipped him off to the Dachau concentration camp, about a 30 minute drive away. Also taken from that home on that day was a 19th century Kiddush cup, typically used to sanctify the Sabbath and Jewish holidays. After five months, Bergman, who was a meteorologist, managed to escape the camp by bribing the guards. He went to England and Montreal, where he worked until his death in 1986. However, this cup was returned to the family in February. His son, Stephen Bergman, a retired sales executive in Maryland, received a small package in the mail from a curator at a Munich museum. And I'm, that's the reason why I didn't share the full thing is because it makes me cry. So read it because it's a lovely article um, and I don't want to, <laughs> to cry on the Internet. Uh, next up, we have this um, interesting conversation and we talked about it it's the same group that were petitioning to not have items returned from american institutions because the argument being that the individuals whose ancestors were sold to buy the metal that they made these benin bronzes are themselves based in the united states their descendants are based in the united states and they are arguing potentially also in england um they are saying that Oxford University should not return the Benin bronzes to avoid, quote, rewarding slavery twice. They, uh, the Restitution Study Group, or RSG, is a legal team campaigning for slave reparations for US descendants of enslaved people. They've asked the university to delay plans for repatriation uh, as a chance to scrap the proposal altogether. Dedria farmer Paleman, who we have talked about before, is the founder of the RSG, and she says that the plans are, quote, morally indefensible, and asked that the university immediately suspend their plans, and that the proposal was, quote, against the express wishes of those of us in the UK, the US, and the Commonwealth, whose ancestors literally gave their lives so the bronzes could be created. Lawyers from the group have argued that to hand back the bronzes would reward the Kingdom of Benin, for its historical involvement with slavery by returning the profits it had gone through the practice. They maintain the Kingdom of Benin traded in slaves and used the profits from this to produce the bronzes, so the artefacts should rem remain in British museums for educational purposes, which um, we briefly touched on <clears throat> last week. Um, it's, it's a really interesting legal challenge. Um, 
The plans are were made in were part of a pledge made in July 2022 from Oxford and Cambridge to return artifacts in their museums, which would see 213 bronzes being returned. They did require approval from the Charity Commission, which was to debate the moral case for handing back the statues, whether it would have a detrimental effect on the university's charity. Cambridge had their plan approved in December, uh, but a similar plan from Oxford to return the bronzes has been delayed, pending a resubmission from the university about its justifications for the repatriation of the objects. Previously, the RSG brought a lawsuit against the Smithsonian Institution, we talked about that lawsuit, to prevent the return of 29 Benin bronzes to Nigeria. They argued that a return of the statues would prevent US descendants and enslaved people from being able to experience their heritage. However, the order was denied, with the court document stating that, quote, the Smithsonian does not appear to have acted beyond its statutory authority by reaching an agreement with Nigeria to transfer some of the Benin bronzes. Um, so I'm just going to have a look through the comment section. This is sort of where I land on this. I I can I can I can see the argument that's being made by the uh, this study group. I can I can I can see where it's coming from. I also can see that the claim and call for restitution and repatriation to Nigeria, to the place where these bronzes were looted from, also makes a lot of sense as uh, like you crazy ass lady i'm very glad that it's not my choice or decision to make i will certainly and we will certainly be following this case as it moves forward and we will see what happens with the cambridge bronzes presumably there's going to be a legal challenge it seems that's what's going to happen and we'll have to see what side the uk courts come down on and i and i'm not going to pretend that i have any idea of what side the UK court is going to come down on. It will be, I think, fascinating to find out, though. And when we do, I will, of course, update you. What's this? You're not sure you can fully follow the reasoning. The point is not that the bronzes are made through the money the country could get through slavery. It was stolen from the said country. So I think the argument that this group is making is that because the bronzes were created using metal from manilas that were traded for human beings, and their their assertion is that these human beings were traded by the in part by the communities um, who took them as prisoners of war potentially. That they were traded to as into the triangular slave trade in reward for these manilas that then got made into the bronzes. The argument, therefore, is that because these enslaved people and their descendants were forcibly taken to the United States or wheresoever else, that returning the bronzes that have been looted back to the place that made them is in essence saying that creating them out of the blood money of slavery was appropriate and acceptable and thus you deserve them back is the argument um I, we will have to see where that where we come down on that it is it's a it's a real marcus t that's what i think it's a quandary it's i'm quite I'm very interested to see how this all shakes out. And I'm very interested to hear the conversations and the points of argument. I think it will be really informative for all of us. So we are hopping on to another repatriation slash decolonisation piece of news. The British Museum is giving something back. They are returning an oceanic sculpture to Polynesia for three years. They this is this is not a return, then it's a lend. It's that they've buried the lead in the title. The British Museum has lent the world's most celebrated oceanic sculpture to Tahiti's main museum for three years. This sculpture, which is utterly fabulous, represents a deified ancestor of the people of Ruatu. 
a small island which is about 600 kilometers south of Tahiti. It's carved out of sandalwood and it stands 1.2 meters tall. The picture doesn't do this justice. It would have been great if it had been seen alongside something else for like perspective. So it's it's like quite a big statue. Until recently, it was thought to have been from the 18th century, but it, the wood has been dated to perhaps the 16th to 17th century, making it one of the earliest surviving Polynesian sculptures. The um, It was in 1821 that some of Ruratu's chiefs had been converted to Christianity, and to demonstrate their allegiance, they sent a boat with A, which is the name of this statue, and other traditional religious objects to the island of Raitia, where the London Missionary Society had a base. Missionaries. Um, William described the arrival of the boat laden with, quote, trophies of victory, <clears throat> the gods of heathens taken in this bloodless war for Christianity. Um, two centuries on, we're told, it's virtually impossible to determine the precise circumstances in which A was relinquished or indeed where ownership of it lay. Since it was apparently voluntarily removed from Ruru II by a small group of islanders, it was not directly looted by Europeans. Yes. Um, we, we, of course, famously, conversion is a, such a gentle process. The London Missionary School took A from Ra to England where it was displayed in their museum in London and then in 1890 it was lent to the British Museum and then in 1911 ownership was transferred uh, the, we are told that it's long been a source of information, inspiration for European artists. Picasso saw a cast of the sculpture in the home of an English surrealist artist and collector Roland Penrose in 1950 and he then ordered another copy for his studio Along with A, the British Museum is lending five other items to Tefari in Mahana, the, or the Musée de Tahiti et des Îles, uh, the Quai Branly Jacques Chirac Museum in Paris, and Cambridge's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology are also lending. A will not be returning to Rurutu since the remote island of 2,400 inhabitants lacks the facilities of the museum in Tahiti, but another cast is in the town hall. Uh, Stephen Cooper, who was a specialist in Pacific art at the University of East Anglia's Sainsbury Centre, describes it as, quote, one of mankind's greatest artistic creation, a thing of great rarity, wonder and curiosity in the positive 18th century meaning of that word. I'm just looking at this comments that have all come in. Um, Deborah didn't get notified. I don't know how to make YouTube do the thing. I don't know. I apologize. It's a it's a shenanigan in general. Yes, the, the problem the, the issue about repatriation is this question of precedent that they that, that's exactly what's going on. They're concerned that a floodgate will open. So yeah, that's what that's certainly what's going on. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. Voluntarily removed, like how the Kohenor was a gift. I'm just I, I'm just I'm processing in my mind what the missionaries would have to have said that would make them would make this community hand over something that has been part of their community, their communities for centuries. I. Yeah. Yes. I don't believe I don't believe that we have examples of these these processes as being benign nor gentle. So what is East Anglia? It's a it's a part of England. Um I am terrible at geography, but it is a it is a it's you know, like you have the southeast, the Midlands, East Anglia. It's a bit of it. It's a bit of it's a bit of the country. I, I couldn't tell you which bits are in it because I am terrible at geography. So that's that's where we that's where we go. <laughs> Reminded of California natives being forced to work at Spanish missions and being converted to Christianity. Yes, exactly. Not not gentle, 
not benign. Um... Oh, <laughs> you were more you were more shocked than anything interesting in East Anglia. Fair enough. But in which case, perhaps you know where East Anglia is and what's in it. In addition to this stuff. <laughs> oh, there we go. Norfolk, Suffolk and Cambridge are East Anglian. Thus, we have it. We are now moving straight on to new news. Oh, hello, my husband's messaged me. Am I in trouble? Am I talking about dinosaurs wrong? Um, a rare 95 million year old titanosaur skeleton has been found in Australia. Now, we went to see the titanosaur exhibition at the Natural History Museum with Gabriel. Yes, my husband, who knows about geography, is telling me a, a historic UK region that includes Norfolk, Suffolk, Cambridgeshire and parts of Hertfordshire. Well, there you go, because he knows geography. He also tells me he loves me. He, oh, he, I'm glad because I'm very bad at geography and I'm the only one who can drive. So we get into problems <laughs> quite frequently. I once tried to go to Bristol. Um, no. Yes, Bristol via Wales. Wales via Bristol. Anyway, I messed it up. We've got a titanosaur. I'm just confessing all of my foibles. You're going to think I'm absolutely useless. You'd be right. Uh, a rare. We, we saw this titanosaur exhibition at the Natural History Museum. It is fabulous. Gabriel was afraid. He did not like the skeleton we've we've discovered. I think he's frightened of skeletons. This has been found in Queensland, Australia. I know where Australia is. I could find that on a map. And it has been dubbed Australia's first nearly complete sauropod skull. The This is research has been published in the Royal Society Open Science open science it describes a 19.6 inch long long skull and details that the find was from a species diamantinosaurus which is a group which is part of the sauropod group including the which also includes the brachiosaurus and the brontosaurus they're known for their small heads long necks and tails and barrel like bodies they called this dinosaur Anne, which is very sweet because, but it's because it was discovered by the, and it was discovered by the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum, which has a cool exhibition. It's found in 2018. It's, and it's the third fossil specimen of this particular type of dinosaur to have been discovered by this museum, and the fourth specimen overall. It was in Australia, or the land that's now called Australia, over 100 million years ago and fell under the Titanosaur group which are the largest animals to have lived on land in Earth's history. Sauropods are also herbivores. We have a quote from the paleontologist, one of the paleontologists who worked on it. Quote, in analysing the remains, we found similarities between the Ann skull and the skull of a titanosaur called Sarmientosaurus musa Cochioi, if I've, I've definitely pronounced that wrong, I apologise, which lived in South America about the same time that Diamantinosaurus lived in Queensland. The details that are similar include the brain case, which is a great way of describing a skull. That might be how I refer to this in the future. It's not just a brain case. It's also a hat rack. The bones from the back end of the skull near the jaw joint and the shape of the teeth, which are conical and curved because they like to rake the leaves off of the branches. Um, according to Poropat, the findings support earlier theories that suggest sauropods used Antarctica as a pathway between Antarctica and South America during the mid-Cretaceous period. Quote, warmer conditions that far south might have been favourable to them. The window between 100 and 95 million years ago was one of the warmest in Earth geology, geology recent history, meaning that Antarctica, which was more or less where it is now, had no ice. Similarly, Australia, which was much further south than today, was warmer with less seasonality. In that climate, Antarctica was forested and might have been an attractive habitat or pathway for wandering sauropods, particularly as they are herbivores. The study has suggested that this um, find was one of the most primitive or not evolved titanosaurs. Learning more about the species of great dino might explain why they were so successful until the dinosaurs 
mass extinction. The brain case is just the part of the skull around the cranium. I'm, it's what I'm going to call mine now. It's no longer a skull. It's my brain case. Let me analyse it in my brain case. I love it. I love it. Um, wandering sauropods, is that a metal bad? I, it's not, but by Jove, it should be. By Jove, it should be. Mysterious things have been found in Qatar's desert. This, When I first saw this picture, I double-checked the date because I was like, this reminds me of crop circles. It's not. These are items. These are patterns and designs that have been carved in soft rock. This is in the sand dunes, in the desert. It's this incredible rock art site. Do go to the uh, news, article, news item for this to check it out. Centuries ago, people are carving in low-lying limestone outcrops. There are symbols, motifs, and objects they clearly observed in their environment. We don't know what they mean. Same with so much of this sort of um, prehistoric art. When asked what it means, one of the people who is studying it, by the name of Sakal, said, it's very difficult to answer. We have no direct clues about the motifs that they found. Quote, in my opinion, opinion they might have a ritual meaning not a drinking game they might have a ritual meaning and function which is so very old that it cannot be explained ethnographically we don't even know how old that because petroglyphs which is the words that this is what this is called and rock art in general are hard to date so there's wild hypotheses about age ranging from the neolithic to late islamic times uh sokol thinks that the carvings were not all made at the same time a decade ago, one scientific study of nine different petroglyphs at Al Jazeera found no evidence of them being more than a few hundred years old. But the research concluded that more studies are needed, including the development of new techniques specific to limestone carvings. While experts cannot surely say what when these petroglyphs were created and by whom, they all agree that the most fascinating and unusual carving at the carvings at the site are those of the boats the boats these so we have these mystery carvings as well here on some of the boats the oars aren't parallel as they would have had to be when they were rowing but they are pointing in different directions this is how they would have looked when the boats were anchored out on the pearl banks and the oars were left oars were left in place for divers to cling to and rest each time they came up Ships had a powerful role in the beliefs of ancient people who saw them as a symbolic means to transit from this world into the next. Both Babylonians and ancient Egyptians believed that the dead needed to reach the afterworld upon a ship. Greek myths spoke of the Freeman Sharon, who carried souls of the dead across the river Styx to the underworld. It may be the oldest ship carvings are echoes of a folk memory reaching far back into prehistoric times. Whatever the reason, we're told, visitors should remember to take water with them and wear a hat and sunscreen when wandering among the carvings to ponder their meaning. The fence site does not have any shaded areas, so the best times to visit are sunrise and sunset. Al Jasai is located just south of the popular Azerbaijani beach, so an, occasion, an excursion there can also be combined with a relaxing day beside the beach. People are referencing real life signs i'm taking it that this is a tv show that i don't know what that means uh somebody will of course say that it's aliens but it almost certainly is human <laughs> and not animal either i'd imagine we have we're still stick we're sticking with the prehistoric and we have here bone fragments that come from the hip of a large mammal such as a horse or a bison that's been discovered near Barcelona in Spain and we can see that there are these little pinprick marks these shows that human beings wore leather clothing 39,000 
years ago, we are told. This is supposed to be, they've discovered a punch board for making holes in leather. Isn't this amazing? We don't, we're told, we don't know about the clothes because they are perishable. So this is an early technology that we are in the dark about. It doesn't appear that this pattern, it represents a decoration or a counting tally, the usual explanation for deliberate patterns of lines or dots in prehistoric objects. Microscopic analysis revealed that the line of 10 indents was made by one tool and the other dots were made at different times by five different tools. Why do we have different types of arrangement on the same bone is the question. So the researchers used an approach called experimental archaeology, which I've talked about a lot on here and I'm a big fan of, in which you try out ancient tools to see how the marks were made. They attempt to replicate the gestures that were used by prehistoric people to produce a specific modification on the bone. Maybe holes for lacing, perhaps. Good, good shout. Yes, that, that's... They found the only way to recreate the types of indent found on this bone was to knock a chisel-like stone tool called a burin through a thick hide, a technique called indirect percussion. This is a technique that's used by modern-day co cobblers and in traditional societies to pierce leather. So they think that this is made during the manufacture or repair of leather items. By punching a hole in leather hide, a thread can be pushed through with a pointed tool to make a tight seam. Ian Gilligan from the University of Sydney in Australia said that this is a very significant discovery. I'd say we had no direct evidence for clothes in the place to seen. So finding any indirect evidence is valuable. The oldest surviving fragments of cloth in the world date from around 10,000 years ago. So we are at 39,000 evidence of cloth clothes making. Um, I think not necessarily like a rivet, more like the hole that you would use to sew together two sides of a garment. I'm not sure if this is for lacing it up. I think this is for creating a seam, maybe, or it could be for lacing like a rivet because because a rivet wouldn't you need to protect the leather, wouldn't you? As well. This discovery helps solve a mystery about the emergence of fitted clothing. Homo sapiens reached Europe around 42,000 years ago, yet eyed needles haven't been found in this region from earlier than 26,000 years ago. And these aren't strong enough to repeatedly punch a thick leather, which makes us wonder how people got to fit them. So this knowledge about making fitted clothing with bone without bone needles is new. They've just got access to this. The location and date are interesting. Southern Europe, 40 thousand years ago, quite soon after the arrival of Homo sapien, during some rapid cold swings in the climate. It's when you'd expect the ancestors to need good clothes um, for protection. Also, they are tanning hides, right? Or curing hides. Doyle and his colleagues argue this punch board marks a, cru a crucial cultural adaptation to climate change that helped modern humans expand to new regions. This punch board was one of six artefacts found at the site, and it could, they say, have been part of a repair kit. I'm sure more news will come. How exciting. We have got Bronze Age and Roman settlements being unearthed in Newquay. When I saw Newquay, I was reminded of my misspent youth. We went there after my exams at GCSE and A-level. Oh, boy, I see me... I don't think I saw it in the daylight. Archaeologists from Cornwall Archaeological have uncovered ancient dwellings from the Bronze Age and Roman period in a settlement in Newquay, England. It was made at the site of a new housing development in Newquay. It's one of the great things when you're going to build new properties and you get the archaeologists in to find some excellent stuff. They found three Bronze Age um, roundhouses and a Roman period settlement, which has an oval house, a processing area that's thought to have been for Syria, and two rectangular buildings that they think were former barns. The discovered dwellings on the site of this housing development also include large quantities of Bronze Age Traveskir ware property, Roman period imported property, and workstone tools from both periods. We have this great picture as well. Um, this, this is the 
Travisca property that was found proper pottery that was found during the dig. One of the senior archaeologists, Sean Taylor, said, quote, although quite a few of these Bronze Age structures have been found at various sites around the country over the last 30 years or so, starting with Trethelan at Newquay in 1987, rare to find so much in one small area. The Roman house is found is similar to buildings found at Trethergi Round near St Austell in the 1970s and are of a type unique to Cornwall. It's Starting to look like this part of Newquay, alongside the River Gunnel, was a very important and densely populated area from the Neolithic period onwards. The estuary undoubtedly formed an important link with the outside world throughout prehistory. You know, all of these places, we're going to chuck ourselves um, into the near buildings and spaces near water because it's so vital a means of transportation. Many of the finds, which include large quantities of Bronze Age Travisca ware property, Roman period imported property and workstone tools from both periods are expected to be housed in a local museum. When we um, know more about where that museum is, I will share it with you. Let's see what we've got here. Did Roman women also come to Britain? Uh, to my knowledge, yes, it's not my period of expertise, but I do believe that the plan Plan more settlement, and in addition to, there were communities that that viewed themselves as being Romano-British, but also there were Roman women that that did the empire spread out. Is my understanding? I am happy to be corrected, but I I do believe it was a it was a fairly there was obviously soldiers outposts, but then there was also residential settlements also. You will, you what? There's not much to tell Dorothy about my after exam stories because I don't remember it <laughs> because that's what I was up to. <laughs> um, Alex has asked a question that I don't think I know the answer to. Does this update our knowledge on Wales? Um, as it's known for not being touched by the Saxons, and I thought it was the same Roman expansion. This is an excellent question, um, which I don't, I don't know the answer to. Um, so let me look into that and see if I can find out. This is because it's, it's very, very far be back outside of my area of expertise. Um, so I will look into that. Thank you, Alex. We are hopping on to Egypt, a high status tomb has been discovered in the Sakara Necropolis. This is a mission that was led by researchers from the Leiden Museum in the Netherlands and the Egyptian Museum in Turin. They have discovered this high-status tomb. This necropolis served for ancient Egyptian royalty and their extended family during the Old Kingdom period. Then during the New Kingdom period, from the 18th dynasty onwards, the necropolis is used by many high-status officials from Memphis. Let me just pop that up. My understanding from my three years of Latin instruction as well, many whole families moved from ambition. Did your Latin instruction include the infamous phrase, Caecilius est in aula? Cerberus est in aula? Salve, Taipuele. <laughs> that is my, La I think Caecilius is the Latin book that was in use for roughly 500 million years, I think. Um, so we are this the tomb they have found belonged to an individual named Pansy, uh, administrator of the Temple of Amon, Amon, sorry, and it dates from the 19th dynasty, which is 1292 BC to 1189 BC. This is when the new kingdom reached zenith of its power under Seti I and his son Ramses II. The tomb has an appearance of a small temple with a central courtyard and it surrounds a colonnade, surrounded by a colonnade. There's a central shaft leading to the burial chamber. There's a relief carving that depicts Pansy worshipping a cow goddess Hathor with his wife at an offering table, along with a funerary priest wearing a leopard skin and sprinkling water in honour of the deceased couple. Excavations to the east side of this monument led 
the discovery of four chapels, one of which, one of which mentions Yahweh, creator of the gold plate of the Pharaoh's treasure, while another chapel features a sculptured portrayal of the tomb's owner and family. And staying with Roman finds, we've got this. These are some really cool pictures. The Roman woman with African ancestry is called the Ivory Bangle Lady. I do want to look that up. Thank you very much. I'm, I think conversations are happening. I'm missing bits and pieces. If if questions are aimed at me um, and I'm not replying, then I'm because I'm looking at four different places. I'm not ignoring you on purpose. I'm just seeing things as they pop up. I've seen a, a midlife crisis saying some written by women. Good. Yes. How do archaeologists, scientists, historians determine the story of a site, hieroglyphics, carbon dating? Excellent question. So I think when it comes to the name of people who are held in a tomb, there is usually labelling of their sarcophagus, perhaps the mummy, perhaps there's signs and signifiers on the wall. Again, this is not my area of expertise that is my understanding uh we're hearing the latin text come up and you were talking about roman women in britain on hadrian's wall that is oh interesting so some were written by women very interesting and yes the tomb usually tells and it's it's based upon expertise as well and, and the capacity to translate the texts in front of you this is fascinating because there's these incredible amount of finds. This is a burial complex dating to the second intermediate period at a necropolis in Luxor. This is a family burial complex. This is the necropolis of Dra Abu El Naga, located on the west bank of the Nile in Thebes, Egypt, north of the necropolis of El Asif and near the dry bay entrance leading up to Deir al Bahri. This necropolis is near the Valley of the Kings. It dates the 13th dynasty. A group of pharaohs that reigned at the beginning of Egypt's second intermediate history, which is circa 1700 to 1550 BCE. Dr. Mustafa Bourazi explained that this discovery is the first of its kind in that cemetery. Uh, it includes a place designated for burials measuring about 50 metres in width and 70 metres in length. Look at... I hope this is all coming up big enough for you. So you've got these estele, something called ushaptis, and a fragment of papyrus, all on this little cloth here. They found 30 burial shafts with similar architectural designs, as well as a mud brick offering chapel containing a collection of ushabatis and amulets. Fabulous. A minister by the name of Anku, who served under under King Sob Sobektop of the 13th, the second of the 13th dynasty, was interred in one of these wells. The burial contained a pink granite sarcophagus with the deceased's name engraved upon it. So there, that's another way in which we are um getting information. They they like to they label things very helpfully. There's another well containing a small funerary stele which is decorated with a scene depicting the owner bringing offerings to the king. According to this inscription, this man held the position of a deputy minister. They found canopic jars, uh, cartonage fragments, several woven baskets. These images have all been released by the ministry, Include, and there's also included in there an inscribed papyrus fragment. This stele that we can see here was discovered at Dra Abul al Naga family burial complex. The Director of General Antiquities of Upper Egypt, Dr. Fathi Yassin, stated that inside the adobe building, there was a group of white-painted Ushbati statues with inscriptions in black ink in heretics, in heretic script. No, nope. erratic script. There were also hundreds of funerary seals without inscription, which are typical of the time before the New Kingdom as well as a sizable group of fiant amulets shaped like the scarabs and the sons of Horus. And there's also a sizable number of beads. Now, 
Now, this is a this is a the next up is um from about a community a civilization that I have literally no idea about the Etruscans. I've heard the word, um, but that is I know absolutely nothing about the ancient Etruscan city. This one has been found in central Italy. And we this is the Volci, named for the Volci people, one of the 12 people of the Etruscan civilization. I couldn't tell you another Etruscan people group. This is one I've heard of because in this article, this is a Volci is a major Etruscan city that developed a trade in precious metals that are mined in the Connelli Metal Fieri Hills. During the 6th century BC, the Volci enjoyed a prosperous period of power and affluence, dominating over cities such as Orbetello, Saturnia, Savana, Castro, uh, Pitalagina, and Marcellina. I'm assuming that these are, maybe the people have that name? That's... There's, a, there's This era is marked by a golden age. There's a thriving trade in exquisite attic property pottery valuable oriental balm unique finely crafted jewels which signals the affluence of this people during the roman etruscan wars another thing that i've heard of but i never thought to look into who the etruscans were the romans took the coast from volci cutting the base of their power which led to the decline of the city the etruscan league splintered apart during the war and the etruscans were soon assimilated into the expanding roman republic Excavations in Volci recently have discovered an Etruscan tomb dating from the 6th century BCE. This tomb is rock cut and it's carved directly into tufaceous rock. I don't know what that means either. Fascinating though. And it's sealed shut by two slabs. Inside the tomb, there is the burial of an Etruscan woman. She was found placed inside an urn on a rock cut platform. There are grave goods in there beneath the urn, including ceramics, a chalice, a spindle, and a traditional brazier with a spit used in funerary rites. The director of the Volci Foundation, Dr. Carlo Cassi, said, quote, analysis of the human remains will further add to our study of the subjects already discovered in this sector of the necropolis of Osteria and the Etruscans of Volci. Ah, during its earliest days, Rome was ruled by Etruscan kings for some time. I need to look into this. I need to look into this more. I yes, it's a it's a complete blank spot in my history. It would certainly be great to find out more on the Etruscans and also for them to be in the news more, because it may be people like me would um, think to find out about them a little bit more rather than just waffling through life going, oh, there's a thing called the Etruscans. I don't know what that means. I should know what that means. We have Roman, Coptic and Byzantine, or Byzantine. I've heard it pronounced both ways. I say Byzantine, but I've heard it uh, said differently. This is discovered in Minya. Oh, hang on. I've swapped... Let me just get back to where I need to go. So we have these tombs that have been found. My thing has just closed unhelpfully. This is a series of tombs from a wide range of periods found by a Spanish and Egyptian group working on the ancient site of Oxyrhynchus in the Bosna region of Minya. They found tombs from the Persian era, three Roman period tomb complex, 16 individual Byzantine and Coptic tombs, all situated in the upper part of the necropolis. The Roman tombs are built of limestone, undecorated, and appeared to have been looted in antiquity. Burials in the rectangular Coptic tombs were found with protective shrouds and some pottery fragments. There are tasks being carried out by the team, which included conservation work on the murals of the basilica on site, the recording of Coptic and Greek wall texts, and the documentation of site structures using photogrammetry, photogrammetry and aerial photography we're seeing some cool information coming in about the etruscans i'm going to look at that later thank you very much we've got another cool thing coming up here um this is pretty i got sent this one a lot these are really cool this is 
shipwrecks that the Theodosius Harbour, they have found 1600 year old women's sandals and a comb. This was uncovered during the excavations of Theodosius Harbour, the second biggest harbour built on the coast of the Marmara Sea. These shoes are absolutely fabulous. And in doing this excavation work, they have detailed information about Istanbul's prehistoric periods. This is an area that's hosted different, of cult different cultures for thousands of years and continues to unite cultures of East and West. Look at these shoes. These have a message on them that translates to use in health, lady, wear in beauty and happiness. Amazing. What a cool shoe to have. The we and then there's also this fabulous comb with different teeth sizes. The question is why these ships are where they are. Some suggest that they were simply abandoned after they served their purpose. However, there is another theory that a southwesterly wind, known as a fugitive in Turkish, uh, is something that begins suddenly in the Marmara Sea during the summer months, and it's something they think might have caused these vessels to sink that and then above the vessels a thick layer of sand sea sand then formed this accumulation filled the harbour and then protected and preserved these sunken ships the rapid burial of the ship created an anoxic environment this preserved the rigging tools the tackles the pulleys the ropes and toggles as well as everyday items like this comb leather sandals straw bar baskets, wooden plates, and a variety of organic and inorganic artefacts like stone and iron anchors. Around the harbour, a number of fragments of sunken ships and other items from earlier areas, eras were discovered. Just utterly fabulous. Utterly fabulous. Um, Robin's coming in hot with some information. Photogrammetry is used to capture detailed imagery, then create digital sets on volumetric stages. That's a word that I've not. Good. Um, LED screens on the backgrounds is, I'm assuming, what volumetric means. Good. <laughs> E.g. the Mandalorian, something I haven't seen. So this is, you know what, I'm going to say it and it's definitely going to be wrong. Is this... The next phase of green screening, CGI film computers. <laughs> Words are hard. <laughs> yes, absolutely. One comb, side of the comb is, seems to be for detangling. The other side is for cleaning your hair. It's just so beautifully jeweled, isn't it? It does. I couldn't find out what the jewel was. Um, Robin says, yes. So that ramble that I just did, <laughs> there was some truth to that yes i think i think it's beautiful to see things written on the shoes isn't that lovely so beautiful our next thing is a roman vase that was once thought to be a cremation vessel is now thought to be a source of early a sort of early sports memorabilia for a gladiator fan. This was found in the soil in 1853 at West Lodge in England. This has been called the Colchester vase, and it was immediately deemed an important find due to its remarkable decorative relief, which we can see in this picture, which shows a gladiatorial battle, thus dating it back to the Roman period. It was thought to be a cremation vessel because it was found containing human remains. Now, though, they don't think it's just a ordinary grave object. Instead, it's sports memorabilia, they are thinking. This research has been done by the people at Colchester and Ipswich Museums, where this artefact has been held. And they have found that the vase was created out of local clay in around 160 to 200 AD. They found there's an inscription on the vessel which spells out the name of two gladiators who are featured in this frieze. This was carved into the clay before the vase was fired, not afterwards, as was previously thought. The engraving was then a fundamental part of the Colchester vase design and not added later. 
this one of the scene creators said a lot of other artifacts that decorate gladiator scenes are generic mass produced pieces so now that we know that the inscription was part of the pot's original design it means it's not a generic piece it's a commemorative piece almost a trophy uh for the trophy cabinet they think that this vase could have been commissioned by a gladiator owner trainer or sponsor or perhaps a sports fan the thought being that there's an intimate connection with the deceased. They could have well have sponsored the games or they were just a sports nut or whatever. They saw this fight and thought, I want a memento of that. This is a continuous narrative freeze on this vase and it features three scenes in the relief. Two hunters battle with a bear, battle a bear with a whip and a cudgel. Then we've got a pair of gladiators memnon and valentius going head to head and then in the last we've got a hunting dog pursuing hare and two stags the research team thinks that such sporting events particularly the one pictured on the vase took place in colchester itself and the studies that's been done on the clay links it with the dna of other similar artifacts discovered in colchester under roman occupation which under a roman occupation was known as camelodium this is the only evidence of Roman arena gladiator combat actually being staged in Britain. This is a specific scene. It had to be representing a specific event. We conclude it was Colchester as it was made and buried here later. I'd say it's really significant in terms of Roman Britain and finding real performers and real people who would have seen a battle in Colchester. This vase, along with other Roman era artefacts, is going to be on display at, quote, Gladiators, a day at the Roman Games. That's going to be an exhibition at Colchester Castle, opening on July the 15th. So if you are going to be in Colchester after July the 15th, this looks like something would be really fun to check out. And if you do, let us know what you think. Apparently, lessons for a secure food future, we're told, can be drawn from the medieval, quote, green revolution. Archaeologists are looking how, at how societies in the Western Mediterranean region overcame environmental obstacles and created a green revolution that lasted for a millennium. This are, These are scientists from the universities of Reading, Barcelona, Granada, York, UCL, Basel, Valencia, Murcia and INSAP, Rabat. They are uh, hoping to, they will be receiving a 10 million euro or 8.8 .8 million pound grant from the EHRC, EHRC or the European Research Council, sorry, not the EHRC, the ERC, to investigate changes in plants and animals over a thousand years in Spain, the Balearic Islands and Morocco. Alongside the events they have found, there are significant ag agricultural advances being made progress in irrigation, land management, introduction of new crops, leading to this green revolution that spreads throughout the medieval Islamic war world. Pardon me. Professor Alex Pulsawaski, who's a medieval archaeologist from the University of Reading and one of the co-directors of this project, said, quote, from your orange juice at breakfast to the rice you have for lunch, to the cotton sheets you sleep in at night, the legacy of the green revolution is still with us more than a thousand years later. Hello, Christina. Welcome. Thank you for making it. And don't worry, you can be late. I'm not taking attendance, but it's lovely to have you here. The project's objective is to chart the climate changes in Western Europe, in this region, before, during and after the Arab conquest, during which increasing aridity in some areas would have presented a significant challenge. Professor Dominic Fleitman, who is a climate scientist from the University of Basel, said, quote, the Mediterranean climate will get hotter and drier in coming decades. This will present major challenges to water and food security. In our globally connected society, this will affect us all. As shoppers have found in recent months with some shortages of fresh food. We want to see how people overcame similar challenges in the past and whether we can learn anything from them. I think this is a really interesting and useful way of approaching history. Because one of the things that is incredibly frustrating about history is I think there is sometimes a desire, a 
habit, if you will, of saying in the past, everybody was stupid and we just learned so much now. Now is the best time to be alive. And in many ways, now is the best time to be alive because antibiotics. But it doesn't mean that our ancestors were stupid or that we cannot uh, learn lots from them, including perhaps, as Wheezy Squeezebox says, lots of great vines, much multi, multi wine. The techniques used by this project's researchers is going to include the microscopic, microscopic study of soils and sediments, analysis of food residues on ceramics, ancient DNA and isotopic analyses of plant remains, animal bones, alongside conventional archaeology. Dr. Rowena Bangera, Banergia, who is a research associate in geoarchaeology from the University of Reading, said, quote, we will use the latest scientific techniques to reveal stories that have been hidden in soils, bones and artefacts. They will help us to understand how migrating populations change the landscape and what they grew and ate, the legacy of which we still see in our lives today. Our brains are famously getting smaller, are they, Alex? Well, that is not evidenced by the size of my head because I have problems <laughs> finding T-shirts that will go over it. <laughs> Maybe I've just got a thick skull. <laughs> Maybe that's... um. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Um, see, this is the thing. I I think that I think that there is there is more available knowledge, presumably in the past, uh, and it's very easy to look down your nose at, at things that happened because people understood the four humours and and stuff like that. But how many of us sitting on this live now, whatever level of education and knowledge we have, how many of us could walk out into a hedgerow? or indeed into our own garden, and pick a plant that we could take for a headache, or a fever, or to deal with a wound. I, I'm guessing that that not many of us could do that. And that, in large parts of society, for much of our history, was a knowledge that was shared, traditionally, by the women of the family. It was it was a woman's art and a woman's craft to care for their families in this medical context. This was something that they had ownership of and thus autonomy over. And that's and that's all been arguably taken from us. And let's be clear as well that the majority of pharmacology is replicating the effect of stuff and making stronger the effect of stuff that grows naturally. The, the tablets we're taking, the paracetamol we're taking, is seeking to replicate the items that were naturally occurring in people's gardens that they could just pick. Willow tree bark is one I've heard of as well for, for a headache. Exactly. There are these things that people knew, The all of these various herbs and some of it is based in some kind of fairly magical ideas, but some of it absolutely worked. The The use of things like rosemary to cleanse down a table before you start cooking, these understanding that they had is, is very, for the most of us, is now lost, and we are now reliant on going to somebody who puts it into a tablet for us and purchasing it from them. Poppies, yes. If you see poppies around, it's fine to grow opium poppies. Absolutely fine to grow opium poppies. If it looks like you've been milking them, <laughs> however, big trouble for you uh, is what I know. We can Google it. We can Google it. And I have a book on herbs and plants too. And I've got pictures of those herbs and plants. How many of you and I? I can look at mushrooms that are that are able that you're able to eat and that are good to eat. I can hedgerow. I can do all of that. Who trusts it? There is no way that I trust myself to go out and pick a mushroom and feed my family with it. Even if I've got the photograph in front of me, I would be terrified that it was poison, that I was going to poison my family. Because I don't, with all of the stuff that's happening, with the kind of commodification and commercialization of, of, of these knowledge that 500 years ago would have been mine by rights, I'm so distant from it 
that I don't trust it. I don't even trust my own eyes anymore to look at a picture and go, yes, I, I can pick that up. Um, I, I, not only would I be careful with mushrooms, I would never go out picking them unless I was with, with somebody who absolutely 100% knew what they were doing and things like what time of year, seasonality. We don't understand, I don't understand things like seasonality. I am an educated person. I don't get seasonality. I don't trust myself to look from a photograph to the floor and go, yep, yeah, that's the same thing. I mean, Lord only knows how I'd be expected to, if I ever needed to, bear witness to some crime and pick somebody out in a lineup. I can't use a mushroom photograph and pick it up off the ground. But yes. We're seeing some lovely, lovely uh, uh, treatment advice coming in. I should point out that nothing in the comment section should be taken as medical advice. You should always consult your primary care physician. I am not a medical doctor. I think I, I feel like I need to put that caveat out there. So, but there, there are things that are, there are things in this chat that are absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. So let's see what, what news we learn from the medieval green revolution. Talking about plants and whatnot. Archaeologists have uncovered the worst world's fast, large-scale dune farm at Caesarea. This is a team of archaeologists from the Israel Antiquities Authority and Bar Ilan University. This is a dune farm from the Middle Ages or medieval period. Situated on the coast of the East Mediterranean in the Sharon Plain, this was an ancient city known as Caesarea Maritima or Maritima during the Roman and Byzantine period, Byzantine, uh, and it was a medieval city during the Arab and Crusader periods. It was first settled during the fourth century BCE as a Phoenician colony and a major trading port during the first century BCE under Hasmonean rule. During the Roman period, the city became the provincial capital of the Roman province of Judea the Roman Syria Palestina and the Byzantine Palestina Prima. Following the Muslim conquest of 640, the city fell under Arab rule during the 7th or 8th century CE. And thus there was a gradual economic decline accompanied by the fleeing Christian aristocracy. Recent excavation have uncovered a farming system in the sand dunes adjacent to the city's ruins. The area has been dubbed the Caesarea Gardens. It's a large 1.5 square kilometre area containing the world's first large scale ju sand dune farming. Researchers found 370 checkerboard crop plots containing uh, marble fragments, coins, stones, ceramic and glass. This material was originally deposited in as waste in landfills around the area, which was then reused for berm construction to harness groundwater and enrich the soil. Researchers say it would have taken hundreds of workers to transport the sand and reconfigure the dunes over a wide area for these gardens. Overall, they estimate that approximately one million work days were invested in this agricultural project. Wowie wowie. The uh, team has found no evidence of archaeobotanical remains or archaeobotanical uh, agricultural waste, possibly due to the soil composition which made it difficult to preserve plant remains. They suggest that the plots were likely used for the cultivation of vegetable rather than orchard, cereal crops or vineyards. Sand dune farming was introduced into various regions, including the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula, the Mediterranean coast, the Sahara and the Atlantic coast of the Iberian Peninsula as a result of Islamic expansion. However, the Caesarea Gardens were abandoned sometime by the Crusaders during the 12th century CE. How interesting is that? Now, I'm also not going to talk about, we're back, just hopping back to mushroom. We're discussing recreational purposes in the comments section. Do with that what you will couldn't possibly comment we're moving on to the moche people they we have found I, we i wasn't there <laughs> archaeologists have found 1400 year old murals of two-faced men in peru i've had a boyfriend like that 
In northern Peru's Nepeña Valley, archaeologists have found murals of two-faced men in golden headdresses. One image shows a man holding a feather fan and a goblet, from which four hummingbirds drink. In another, a man's got a feather fan as well as an unknown object that is partially obscured. It's thought they are 1,400 years old and they are incredibly detailed and, it'll be, as we can see, very colourful. But we're also being told they are unique because images like this have, quote, never been before seen in Moche art or any other pre-Hispanic tradition of the Andean region. So we can see them being uncovered here in this picture. So yeah, I feel, I feel like... um. <laughs> <laughs> the love life has uh, hit, hit has hit a nerve. Yes, we've all been there, haven't we? And I'm sure the gents in the comments have also had boyfriends and girlfriends. Or indeed, the ladies in the comments have also had girlfriends. Like that. It's not just everybody can be a bumhole <laughs> if they put their mind to it. It's not just boys, but uh, I date men. Not now, I'm married. I take my husband. I'm going to stop digging. We have the uh, research being led alongside Lisa Trevor, an archaeologist and art historian at Columbia University. We've got Michelle Coons, an archaeologist at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and they think that they have uncovered less than 10% of the paintings at this site. This is exciting. That means there's more to dig, dig, dig. Um, We're also, do you know what? We've also, I should have gone with politicians. There are certainly, I think, when I heard that a, a king of Scots who was in prison in England had two barbers, my first thought was, was that to shave both of his faces? Because people in power, that tends to be, they tend to be Janus like, I feel. So, Panama was a place of remarkable artistic innovation and creativity, with painters elaborating on their knowledge of artistic canons in creative and meaningful ways as the people of the Peña established their position in the far southern Moche world. Trevor says in a statement, quote, our project has the potential to inaugurate a new period of understanding and appreciation of Moche art, including by contemporary artists who use their ancestral works as inspiration in their own pr practice. These murals were found on a pillar inside a ceremonial hall. Oh, hello. Um, they don't know what the two-faced men represent, but they have a few theories, possibly deities, uh, though this possibility is less likely, as Moche art more often portrays deities with non-human characteristics like fangs or wings. Instead, they think that the artist might have been experimenting with how to show movement. Cool! And two narrative moments at once. That's so cool. This work on this site has been going on for more than 50 years. In addition to the two-faced man murals, they have also found other examples of Motre art, including a mural of a priestess performing a ceremonial sacrifice. There's also murals that depict a bat and a serpent. We are told that these murals are truly spectacular and that the new discoveries will, quote, no doubt signify significantly age archaeological and art historical, no doubt significantly aid archaeological and art historical efforts to reconstruct the cosmological meanings and religious narratives of Moche iconography. Do you know what? It's like doing tongue twisters sometimes. Some of the way they put these sentences together. Researchers are going to return to the site later in the year. They think they, they have already seen a glimpse of a similar mural. They could just see the edge of a straight feather fan and the hand that holds it. More to see. They are eager to return. I don't blame them. And to continue to share their findings, we will update you as they come in. Um, Kuhn said in a, a team statement that, quote, it is an absolute honour to work at this important monument of the ancient world. We are only beginning to comprehend the mysteries revealed by these murals. <sighs> yes, very good. Oh, it's very good. We've also got a Mayan ball game marker that's been discovered at Chichen Itza. This is a depiction of the Maya ball courts. This Chichen Itza is a pre-Columbian city built by the Maya people of the terminal classic period. Known simply as Pelota or ball, 
The origin of the Maya ball game can be traced back more than 3,000 years. The importance of the game is highlighted in Popol Vul, which narrates the history of the Kichi people and their rulers. This game is depicted as a way to reenact battle between the forces of darkness and light as a religious event of regeneration that the Maya saw as being integral to their continued existence. Meanwhile, we look at medieval games of football, which just seemed like an ex- excuse for a a massive punch up <laughs> i'm sure there was violence involved here too playing the game and making sacrifices were ways in which the maya demonstrated their devotion to their gods scholars have differing opinions about the ways in which individuals were targeted for ritual killings during these games and the frequency of such sacrifices archaeologists excavating the casa colorada architectural complex the so-called Red House, discovered a ball game marker that dates from the Terminal Classic or early post-classic period. This marker measures 32.5 centimetres in diameter and weighs up to 40 kgs. It's decorated with a bas-relief glyphic band which surrounds an iconographic interior containing two figures that can be interpreted as Maya ball players. Describing the engraved engraved image, archaeologist Santo Alberto Sobrino Fernandez explained that, quote, the character on the left is wearing a feathered headdress and sash that features a flower-shaped element, probably a water lily. In line with the face is a scroll, which might be interpreted as the breath or voice. The opponent wears a headdress known as a snake turban, whose representation can be seen on multiple depictions in Chichen Itza. How fabulous is this? But that's not all. There is another thing that has been found that is cool. They have found a ritual landscape connected to ancient Andean gods. Good. Um, archaeologists can, I'm just seeing what my husband is texting me. Apparently, the next stage of CGI is the wall. <laughs> uh, the archaeologists conducting a study in the Calangas region of Highland Bolivia have discovered a ritual landscape connected with the Andean cult of Waka. What we have here, this is a study that was published in the journal Antiquity. They have identified 135 hilltop sites associated with agricultural production areas by a variable number of concentric walls on terraces. At each location, they found a large quantity of pre-Hispanic ceramic fragments. Uh, Most of these ceramic fragments are bowls, plates and small jars, indicating their use in commensal and ritual practices. Evidence suggests these sites were used as ceremonial spaces known as waka, a practice which emerged during the late intermediate period. Everything is ritual. This is not a drinking game. I'm I'm seeing the I'm seeing the glasses in the comments. <laughs> I do not approve this message. <laughs> Am I laughing? Yes. It's very naughty though. <laughs> um, this site has a perimeter ring comprising 39 adjoining enclosures, each with a surface area between 106 and 144 meters squared, enclosing a plaza of approximately one HA is a hectare. Is HA a hectare? Um, Maybe. Um, It's scattered with abundant ceramic fragments ascribed to the late intermediate and late periods. This site is visually and spatially associated with the principal sacred mountains, multiple Multiple walled circular constructions and burial towers adorned with patterns imitating Incan fabrics. It is possible that this structure was first referenced in the chronicles of the priest Bartolome Alvarez, who travelled through the Carangas region during the 1580s. Alvarez heard of the existence of a quote large circular building to which the indigenous leaders of the region were would come to meet to perform ceremonies for the sun in the month of June. According to the authors of the paper who've been looking at this, quote, this ceremonial structure and the ritual landscape in which Wasikiri is situated provides rich material for further study, please do, of the pre-Islamic, 
pre-Hispanic history of this part of the Andes, an area that has generally been understudied. Further research will allow investigators to test these initial hypotheses and interpretation. Yes, 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 yes. More knowledge. More knowledge. Pislani is defending themselves, saying, I'm drinking sweet tea. Well, good. Some of us are drinking water and some of us are drinking flavoured water, Carol. Carol. And H A is a hectare. I so I knew a thing in the back of my brain case, <laughs> skull case, whatever the word we were using. Um, I knew it. I, did, I couldn't tell you how big a hectare was. It sounds big though, large, spacious. We're moving to a period that I know a little bit. <laughs> also. <laughs> Ossifer. I thought we were talking about ossification there. Bone turning to bone. We're moving now to a period which I know a little bit more about, namely the Tudor period. Archaeologists have revealed traces of Henry VIII's Otford Palace. This is a team of community archaeologists. They have conducted a survey in Kent in England and they think they have found traces of Henry VIII's Otford Palace, which is also known as the Archbishop's Palace. It's in the parish of Otford in Kent, hence the name, unsurprisingly, uh, which is a few miles to the south southeast of Greater London and is adjacent to the Pilgrim's Way. The origins of this present site can be traced back to the Saxon period, yet the first documented mention of a structure on the site was by Lanfranc, who was Archbishop of Canterbury, when it was valued at £60 in the Doomsday Survey of 1086. Worth pointing out that also something another site that features in the Doomsday, Doomsday Survey is Hampton, whereupon the Palace of Hampton Court now stands. We're sticking with Otford. Over the course of the next 400 years, the original manor house underwent significant expansions under the remodelling of Archbishop William Courtney. He transformed the house into a stunning edifices, edifice, edifices, into a stunning edifice with a great hall in the late 14th century. 150 years later, William Warham, who was Courtney's successor, William Warham, Archbishop of Canterbury, um, before we get Thomas Cranmer, made a last impact on Tudor building design with the construction of a building that can be seen as a precursor to Hampton Court and many styles of Tudor architecture. Warham embarked on a complete redesign of Otford in 1514, creating a palace that was fitting for a prince of a church. And let's be clear, there were documents and descriptions of exactly what a bishop's or archbishop's palace should look like. Uh, that is pretty much the formula that Wolsey is working from when he builds the Hampton Court also. Cardinal Wolsey took Warham's place as the key political leader in Tudor England, at which I, I tens intensified a rivalry that was going to continue until Wolsey's death. I think Wolsey, I've talked about this, Wolsey thought that he was going to outlive Warham and potentially become the Archbishop of Canterbury himself as well. Off Palace was designed and laid out on such a scale that it does compare favourably with any of the largest contemporary palaces in England. It's 163 metres by 98 metres and it covers an area greater than places like Nonsuch Palace or even the moated area of Eltham. It, during the English Reformation, Henry VIII acquires Otford. It becomes a royal palace with the title of the Honour of Otford in 1537. There was investment by Henry, but at this point he is like, he's got palaces coming out of his pockets. He's just got so many palaces. The upkeep was insufficient. It's hard to keep track of all of what's going on. And the condition of the building did gradually worsen. From 1553 to 1558, Cardinal Reginald Pole, who was the final Roman Catholic Archbishop of Cath Roman Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury under Mary the First, he lived at the palace. He was the last of fifty-six Archbishop of Canterbury's to occupy the palace before it fell out of use. This project of archaeology is been led by the Darrant Valley Landscape Partnership. This organisation is looking to conserve and enhance distinctive heritage landscape in the. Darrant Valley. 
the survey measures the pattern differences as electrical current and it's passed. So they've been using um, electrical resistance survey to they pass this current through the ground. It reveals archaeological features that can be mapped when they are of a higher or lower res resistivity resistivity um, than their surroundings. This study has now revealed the northwest tower of the palace and the western range, showing the higher resistance where the wall foundations lies. The Hidden Palace, Otford's own Hampton Court project, is working alongside the Archbishop Palace Conservation Trust to safeguard the palace's future and make it more accessible to the local community. Good times. Well, they learnt that the hard way, but at the time, of course, when, when, when Wolsey is first building Hampton Court Palace, it's ideal because it's it means that church money can be used to host diplomats and ambassadors. So it's not Henry's purse that's paying for it. It's church money that's paying for it. So all to the goodness. And Wolsey was extravagantly wealthy uh, when, when he was at the zenith of his powers. One year's salary, one year money that he earned from his various holdings and titles in 2017 money would be the equivalent of 9.6 million pounds one year for one year he earned that so him having this lavish palace where he can entertain guests that should be arguably there at henry's expense i can sort of see why this is a in quotes a good thing of course when you are a man made by henry's favor he can also unmake you A newly discovered Artemisa Gentileschi painting is coming to auction alongside works by three other female old masters. A quartet of pain paintings by Italian female old masters have been rediscovered and they are hitting the auction block in Vienna. The headliner piece is this one that we can see here, Abraham and the Three Angels. The last time it came to it came to market it was presented as a bernardo cavallino painting in 2014 it was bought uh in accordance to the artnet price database but dorotheum's provenance records for the painting show that it found a buyer through the auction house post sale cavallino is a significant name in his own right with a 3.9 million sale at sotheby's in new york in january breaking an auction record that has stood at 1.9 million for 34 years but with a growing interest in historical female women artists, the reattribution of the canvas could spark new interest in this work. Artemisa is an artist who is much more in the consciousness of art historians at the moment. Um, Karen, you love Artemisa. Well, then, I'm, I hope you're going to love this, uh, this story. Artemisia Gentileschi, I think that's how you pronounce it if i have missed artemisia gentileschi is i think how it's pronounced artemisia gentileschi we are told her personal history was disturbing let's say to 19th century taste alluding to some very unpleasant violence that occurred uh, at, at the hands of her art teacher and then also when she was uh tried the the case was tried therefore her works are often given to male artists given attributed to male artists who were working in the same arena her earth her authorship was somehow lost for political reasons these were deliberate misattributions it was the art historian giuseppe porcio who first proposed the new attribution pointing to the stylistic similarities to other known gentileschi works as well as the written record of payments to the artist in 1645 for a large painting featuring Abraham that is otherwise unaccounted for. Uh, close examination of the painting suggests that it, the hand of not one but two artists, indicating that it was a collaboration with Palumbo, one of her unknown studio assistants. Quote, he's probably responsible for one of the angels and some of the background, MacDonald said. This kind of two-handed composition done by two artists was common practice we tend to attribute attribute 
paintings to single artists, but often they are working with collaborate collaborators. Gentileschi, is it? Gentileschi. Gentileschi. Okay, very good. Artemisia Gentileschi. This is beautiful. An 18th century bowl made from one of the rarest porcelains in the world has sold for $25 million at Sotheby's in Hong Kong, isn't this? Look at it. It's just fabulous. This is a rare 18th century porcelain bowl. It measures less than four inches in diameter and it was produced in imperial kilns during the time of the Yongzhen Emperor, who ruled China from 1722 to 1735. It was later enamelled in the workshops of the Forbidden City of Beijing. This is a striking example of Falenkai or foreign colours porcelain, which is now just considered to be among the rarest and most valuable materials of the Qing dynasty. This cream white bowl depicts intertwined apricot and willow trees and a pair of swallows. Inscribed on one wall is a poem that's believed to have been commissioned by the Wanli Emperor. It says, scissors of jade cut through flowers like rainbow garments brought back from the moon. <sighs> the object was once part of a pear, uh, but it and the other bowl were divided and sold for £150 in 1929. The other dish now lives at the British Museum. Of course it does. No such record was broken, with, but this time the bowl was offered in a single lot sale on Saturday morning at the Hong Kong Convention Exhibition Centre. It was purchased by a private unnamed Chinese collector for less than the object's pre-sale estimate of $25.4 million. This event was one of nine auctions organised as part of Sotheby's Spring Sales Series in Hong Kong. Quote, to reaffirm Sotheby's continuous leadership in Chinese art and witness some exceptional results this season feels particularly poignant amidst the year in which we celebrate our 50th anniversary in Asia, says Nicholas Chow, Sotheby's chairman of Asia. Quote, when we first entered the region in 1973, we did so with sales in this category and they have remained at the forefront of our business ever since. The comment that made me muttly. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> Facts and truth and for sure. Abs absolutely. That is a very polite way. That was a that's a very polite way of putting it. <laughs> and it's one that may enter my uh, my regular parlance. <laughs> Oh boy, yeah. Um, yes, I, I, I. When I really like something, I do go full muttly. Um, it's not attractive, but it, <laughs> but it's who I am. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> shiny, shiny gold. We. This is uh, excavations in Rocklaw in Poland have discovered gold coins dating from the 18th century. This discovery was made. This is a very hard name to say i apologize in advance i even googled it but i've forgotten what it told me it was said how it was pronounced this is the historical prismiski mikolashki district it's located west of the medieval city center this uh, was part of the city was a former location of the villages of nabitin and stapin According to the excavation team, in the years 1768 to 1783, this area was developed for the Ravelin Bastion fortifications by the Prussians, where archaeologists found mass graves related to the annexation of the city during the War of Austrian Succession by the Prussians. 
This War of Austrian Succession was a European conflict that occurred predominantly in Central Europe, the Austrian Netherlands, Italy, the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. The Habsburg Empress Maria Theresa ceded most of her territory in the Treaty of Breslau in, or Breslau, in 1742 to Prussia. According to this treaty's terms, Maria Theresa surrendered the majority of the Silesian duchies to Prussia, with the exception of the Duchy of Teschen, the Tropau and Kronov districts situated south of the Opfa River, and the southern region of the Duchy of Nysa, which were designated the province of Austrian Silesia. <sighs> Excavations of the graves revealed gold coins, including a gold ducat of the Republic of the Ukraine provinces of the Netherlands from 1748, a gold ducat from 1750 of the Francis I Stephen, Francis I Stephen of Lorraine, Francis I Stephen of Lorraine is an interesting sentence, and a 1750 half gold sovereign of his wife, Maria Theresa Habsburg, Francis the first Stephen of Lorraine. All three coins have been given to the City Museum of Rocklaw for an exhibition to the public. So if you are in Poland and you see it, then do let us know what you think. Some some love of the Muttley. We have this, I've, we're up to the 19th century now, and we have DNA evidence that is shedding light on one of America's uh, oldest black churches. New research links in Williamsburg, Virginia, to the first permanent building of the first Baptist church. In 1776, free and enslaved black worshippers began to meet secretly in Williamsburg. Williamsburg. Berg, sorry. But there is a Williams Burger, though, that does sound delicious. The, in 1818, this congregation called the First Baptist Church constructed its first permanent meeting house. But that meeting house was destroyed by a tornado in 1834. So in 1856, a new brick church was built on the same site of what is now Nassau Street. This building stood for 100 years until Col uh, Colonial Williamsburg, a living history museum, purchased the property, which demolished the church uh, and built a parking lot at the site in 1956. The First Baptist Church did use the proceeds from that sale to fund the construction of a new worship house about a mile away. Oh, it's all right, Pistol Annie. We, we, we know about we know cap if we need to use caps, we need to use caps. All caps. If, you, if that helps you see, so you can communicate with us, you crack on. Don't you worry. Uh, after so historians are now starting to unravel some of the long lost secrets of the historic church's original location. They have done DNA analysis and they have found that three men buried at the site were members of the church's congregation in the early 19th century, confirming what had already been suspected, that the church buried members of its congregation on the property. Now, I'm going to say something based upon American students that I have spoken to. Is this something that is strange in America, that you would bury people beneath your chapel or church? Bearing in mind I live in London and virtually every church we have old church is is essentially the house for a thousand corpses this is always we are told that has always seemed the most logical explanation for these burials without definitive proof we couldn't rule out the possibility that the burials were associated with another group or from a different time period we are told that now the congregation can decide how to move forward the excavations arose as part of colonial William Williamsburg's broader attempts to make its living history museum more accurate and inclusive. We are told that black residents made up more than half of Williamsburg's population throughout the 18th and 19th century, but Colonial Williamsburg did not begin including black history in its materials until 1979, reports Ben Finley for the AP. So 
more study, better interpretation, fabulous news all around. So I'm seeing some different things coming in from from the Americans. I'm saying Susanna's saying you don't do that here. Um, Vert is telling that they get buried in the backyard. There was a TV show over here called Brookside, and when I hear about this, I'm, I don't know if if you're telling if you're making a kind of nod and a wink about like doing a murder and then burying them on the patio or if you actually mean that people bury their family members in their backyard because I think of Brookside and that somebody got put under the patio as a secret squirrel thing so um but Karen says that you're on record it's not that strange so some of your churches do have um people inside them underneath <laughs> my husband's just come off this and shook his head at me I'm not quite sure which bit um made him shake his head but uh it was uh some some bit of it oh the brookside thing that's what made him shake his head oh it's not done in the modern it's not done in the modern era i mean we have cemeteries that are separate from any church yes um but we also do we do still put people in churches i think i mean we reinterred richard the third in a church and i'm pretty sure that you can still be buried within a church i'm do you know what it is it's because you because it, you have more space like there's more space we are we are short of we are short of ground Upon which and within which to bury our our dead, so we, we've got to go under the floorboard. <laughs> it's legal. It's all above board. It's all above board. Um, I saw I I saw a comment saying about it being uh, prohibited to be buried inside a church in this country. Someone said I can't I can't find the comment now. Um, from the reign of Queen Victoria, I didn't. I don't know about that, and I. It may well be the case. Um, I haven't looked to bury anybody in a church recently. I will look into that, though. I think you would have to be very posh to be buried in a church, very posh, and also um, prepared to and rich as well as posh. I think we, of course, we still bury we still bury people in in churches because that is the royal the royal tomb is beneath a church in Windsor, so we are still burying people inside. Uh, religious houses over here so is he is Stephen Hawking in Westminster I will have to check that out I don't know because of course the other thing that we do is that we do memorials to people in certain churches where they aren't buried so there's a Shakespeare memorial in Southwark but he's buried in Stratford, but you'd think his tomb was in Southwark because there's a whole rigmarole of like a stained glass window to him and the whole works. But he isn't there. He's somewhere else. But then, of course, there was a whole thing of, particularly for monarchs, having bits and pieces of them located in different settings. So Jane Seymour, the mo majority of her is at Windsor beside Henry, but a whole a heart and lungs, I believe, her lungs, her heart, both are supposedly buried beneath Hampton Court Chapel. So we do, we do do weird, weird stuff like that as well. Not now. I don't think we do. We do innards, but we used to. Oh, thank you. The Ashes of Stephen Hawking were buried Friday in a corner of Westminster Abbey. There are some of, some of Britain's greatest scientists between the graves of Charles Darwin and Isaac Newton. There we are then. There we are then. So, very interesting. Um, continuing on with this, we as well as as well as the DNA stuff. I'm just going to move this. Um, 
In 2020, William, Colonel Williamsburg began excavating the site in partnership with the First Baptist Church Senate Community, as well as the Let Freedom Ring Foundation and the College of William and Mary. They then, in 2021, said that they had unearthed the foundation of the 1818 building. They found 63 grave, sh grave shafts, um, and they then, from those, selected three graves for further study, which we just talked about. They, one of the remains they said was a man between sixty and eighteen years of old years of age, according to his teeth. They think that because of his teeth, it indicates he may have been enslaved as a child. They said that his coffin appeared to have been reinforced with extra nails, suggesting someone moved his remains and then reburied them in the church cemetery. Although experts aren't sure of why, that's really fascinating. A piece of a wine bottle might have been used to mark the location of the grave sites. The researchers couldn't recover DNA from the other sets of remains, but they did find out stuff from osteological analysis. These were also two men, roughly between the ages of 35 and 45, and they were all, all three were buried in the first half of the 19th century. It's thought that this these individuals were likely part of the generation that built the first meeting house. In addition to human remains, they also found archaeological artefacts on the site, including buttons, straight, a straight pin and coffin nails. They completed their studies and then reburied the remains on the original site. Once a broader excavation work wraps up, Colonial Williamsburg officials plan to find a way to memorialise those buried on the, on the property. Quote, all over the country, there has been a reckless disregard for African-American bodies, says Connie Matthews Harshaw, a member of the First Baptist Church. We are now becoming an example to the rest of the country. That is a very good point, Marianne. It becomes illegal to bury in your yard when funeral homes start owning and burying people in plots. Yes. It gets more and more expensive to get married when it becomes something that isn't just recognised by the community, when you take away the notion of common law spouse, which was certainly in force for a very long time. That is a, how do you determine that it's a permanent building rather than a temporary one? It's an excellent question. That is an excellent question. I mean... And when I think about a temporary building, I think about the structures for the Field of the Cloth of Gold, where there was a brick foundation and a fabric topper. That's not what's going on here. So for me, a temporary building is bits and pieces of it, a fabric. Do they mean a temporary building because it came down and then got then got built up again? Um, so it was temporary because it was only there temporarily. Are they, they're not saying that it was intended to be temporary, right? Or are they? Here we've got a challenge. You can find out if your ancestor is among the 19th century silhouettes in a newly digitised collection. The Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery has launched a microsite to open up a treasure trove of more than 1,800 cut paper silhouette busts by American artists. Is that... I'm saying Batchy, William Batchy. We, so we are told that they have found some intriguing stories, but what they are hoping for is that if they give raw data to people, scholars and the general public looking for their ancestors, that they are going to get secrets unlocked for them. The site offers an easy, this is all linked in the description box and in the um, opera pin board. This site offers an easy search tool for perusing the 1800 silhouettes in the ledger. And museum officials are venturing that tens of thousands of people currently living in the in the US might have connections to the album. They are saying this is a gift. Someone could find a portrait of a great great grandparent whose appearance was unknown to them before. Indeed, the shades of someone's ancestor could be just a click away. If any of you lovely people happen to peruse this search tool, peruse the silhouettes using the search tool, and you find one of your own ancestors faces do let me know especially if you get that confirmed that is fabulous can 
170-year-old Bourbon be salvaged from a cargo ship in Lake Michigan? That is the probably very expensive question, I'd imagine. A decade ago, the Westmoreland was discovered. It sunk to the bottom of Lake Michigan in 1854 after being lost in a, in a storm. Lots of precious cargo from gold to booze, and it went down that winter night. Ross Richardson, historian and diver, found the shipwreck in 2010. He, he, the historian wrote a book on the, on the history of the shipwreck that killed 17 people. And according to the book, the rumour is that there was $10,000 in gold coins. Is that $10,000 in them in then money or in now money? Regardless, it's either a lot of money or a lot of money. Lot, lot of money. And also 280 barrels of whiskey that sunk with the ship during its wreck. These were intended to be delivered to soldiers uh, who were on Mackinac Island. Since the spirits were in wooden barrels, it's unknown how much is still preserved and what the quality of the alcohol is. But if there are 280 barrels worth of spirit, that equals to about 74,200 fifths bottles if each barrel fills up 265 fifths. That's hard maths. Very hard maths. Richardson told the Mirror, quote, we're in the beginning stages of discussing a salvage operation to recover the whiskey casks and possibly other artefacts. Some regional distilleries in the area are Traverse City Whiskey Company, the Grand Traverse Distillery, Mammoth Distilling and Iron Fish Distillery. The whiskey will most likely be under the Sunken Scotch category. There are quite a few of these whiskies that were lost at sea. One of them reported is the SS Politician, which was wrecked during World War II off the coast of Scotland. USA Steer reported that a bottle of the blended Scotch whiskey from the SS Politician has a starting price. <sighs> a bottle has a starting price of $12,000. Mackinac is the pronunciation. Thank you, Carol. Right, so... There were 28,000 cases of malt whiskey that went down with this cargo ship as it was making its way to Jamaica and New Orleans in 1941. Another shipwreck that was travelling with spirits is the SS Wallachia, according to ScottishShipwrecks.com. This cargo steamer had whiskey, gin, beer and other materials on board. This steamer left Glasgow for Trinidad and only had one passenger on board. Yes, <laughs> you got very drunk. <laughs> the cargo steamer was involved in a crash with a Norwegian steamer in 1895. The Wallachia actually sunk to the bottom of the ocean and was just rediscovered by divers in 1977. The, we're, we're talking about the question, the question of, of how of the quality of the whiskey, and I suppose. It's about getting it up. I said that out loud. It's about retrieving it from the bottom of the water and seeing if somebody's brave enough. Look, it's either going to be actually still whiskey or it's going to be salt water or it's going to be some kind of weird paint stripping vinegar that, that may, in fact, do you some serious damage. <laughs> Searchers have located two of three shipwrecks from the 1914 Lake Superior. <laughs> Truth. Truth. Is Lake Michigan a freshwater lake? Is ah, in which case it's just going to be wet, extra wet. There we go, pre watered down. I was not aware that Lake Michigan was a freshwater lake. Look, fish flavored whiskey. Do you know what? Delicacy, delicacy, mate. So, it's located two or three shipwrecks from the 1914 Lake Superior tragedy. 
the we have found we are told um the wreckage of two ships that disappeared in 1914 and they're hoping that it will lead them to a third that sank at the, at the same time killing nearly 30 people these were a trio of lumber shipping vessels apparently all the great lakes are fresh water thank you very much i um i will remember that the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society announced the discoveries this month after confirming details with other researchers. Rick Mixter, a board member of the Society and Maritime Historian, called witnessing these discoveries, quote, a career highlight. It not only solved a chapter in the nation's darkest day in lumber history, but also showcased a team of historians who have dedicated their lives towards making, these, making sure these stories aren't forgotten. The Society, these vessels were owned by a lumber company and they sank into the ice cold lake when a storm swept through as they moved lumber from Michigan to New York. The steamship C.F. Curtis was towing the schooner barges Selden E. Marvin and Annie M. Peterson. We're giving them people names. OK, um, all 28 people aboard were killed. The Curtis was found in the summer of 2021, the Marvin a year later, within a few miles of discovery. This organisation operates a museum in Whitefish Point, and they run searches for shipwrecks to, in the hopes of telling the lost history of the Great Lakes, the focus being on Lake Superior. Quote, one of the things that makes us proud when we discover these things is helping piece the puzzle together of what happened to these 28 people. It's 109 years later, but they're maybe some family members still who want to know what happened so they can now answer those questions. The wrecks were discovered about 20 miles or 32 kilometres north of Grand Marais, or Marais, Michigan, further into the lake than the 1914 account suggested the ships would have sunk. There is damage to Marvin's bow and to the Curtis's stern, making them wonder whether there's going to be a collision that might have occurred. They are going back this summer to see if they can answer some of these questions. There is video footage of the Curtis wreck and they've also they've got the team's jubilant cheers as the words Selden E. Marvin came into view on a video shot by an underwater drone. They said, quote, we're the first human eye to see it since 1914, since World War I, one team member mused. We have lost a very important figure. The one of the the last surviving Nuremberg prosecutor has died at 103. I do recommend reading the linked articles for a full obituary. Ben Frank was just 27 when he secured the convictions of Nazi officers for war crimes and crimes against humanity. He later advocated for the establishment of an international court to prosecute human rights, prosecute war crimes, and thus protect human rights. This goal was realised in 2002. He passed away in his sleep peacefully in an assisted living to facility in Boynton Beach, Florida. The US Holocaust Museum said that the world has lost, quote, a leader in the quest for justice for victims of genocide. His son, Donald, who also works in international law, said that he remembers his father as someone who dedicated his life to, quote, trying to make it a more humane world under the rule of law. He had seen and experienced things which were so horrific, they fueled a passion which took him through, took him not only through the court at Nuremberg, but fueled really the rest of his life. He described his father as a funny and mischievous person, but one who worked every day of his life. So may his memory be a blessing. There is a new technique for analysing archaeological bones. The title says that it is making the invisible visible. This is a method that has been developed by an Italian team and the hope is that it will revolutionise the field of archaeology and radiocarbon dating in order to protect our cultural heritage. They, This is an important achievement which has been published in the journal Communications Chemistry in the result of extensive research by a 
coordinated by Professor Sara Talamo, in which experts in the field of analytical chemistry from the University of Bologna and the University of Genoa, Genoa collaborated. They have developed a new technique for analysing archaeological bones that for the first time makes it possible to quantify and map at high resolution the presence of collagen, the invisible protein that is essential for making radiocarbon dates and thus obtaining new information on um, human evolution. So this technique not only allows allows not only selecting the best specimens but also choosing the sampling point in the selected ones based upon the amount of collagen predicted. This method helps to drastically reduce the number of samples that are destroyed for 14C analysis with, and within the bone it helps to avoid the selection of areas that may present a quantity of collagen not sufficient for dating. The potential of the method proposed in the present study lies in the type and amount of information that predictive model provides uh, addressing two fundamental and complementary questions for the characterization of collagen in bones, how much and where. So essentially what this does is, is it allows them to find the bit in a bone or to find whether a bone should be sampled for radiocarbon dating. It therefore also pinpoints the place it's the best area to take that sampling from so what it means is you're not invading or destroying or damaging a bone without being able to get the requisite stuff to do the radiocarbon dating on top of that if there is a bone so either you leave a bone alone because there's nothing there to use or you are pinpointing the specific place where you're going to get stuff that's useful so you haven't got to keep going back hence the reason why we um end up with this being something that's also going to preserve as well as give us new information. That's, do you know what? That's a perfect way of putting it, Les. No more needle in a haystack. That is what this is going to do. This innovative and incisive combination of NIRHSI spectroscopy pre-screening and the radiocarbon method provides for the first time detailed information about the presence of collagen on archaeological bones, reducing laboratory costs by dating only materials suitable for 14C and increasing the number of archaeological bones that can be preserved and therefore available for future research. This is the amount of new science that we have talked about over the last weeks and months that is coming out, that is making, well, we, we were talking about LIDAR for ages and ages and ages, this kind of really that was being put to incredible uses. And it just seems like every time there's something new and cool that's going to sort stuff out. Snacking on my supporting women flipping the status quo M&Ms. They are purple and green. I have no idea why. I don't know what you're referring to, but they sound fun. So excellent. Purple and green. Well, they are part of the British suffragette colours, purple, white and green, mayhap, could be, possibly, allegedly, that's what it says, it finds, it finds, it finds collagen, it's a, it's a collagen seeking missile of science. Yes, m, &M I know M&M's are, are candies, but I, I, that's, very excellent. Fabulous. We don't have those over here. The, uh, the what are they called? The Supporting Women Flipping the Status Quo S M &Ms. We haven't got that here. Or if we have, I haven't seen them. Well, now then, here we go. Let's all, let's all um, share some rage, shall we? I don't know what's going on here, but I don't like it. A blue crayon has been used to decorate a 230-year-old Sabrina statue at Croom or Chrome. Bright blue crayon markings were, scr were scrawled over the face, arms and torso of this 230-year-old statue that is in Worcester. It's a memorial to the landscape architect Capability Brown and it was defaced sometime during the, during the day April the 8th, according to the National Trust. They have removed the markings, but there is still needs work to clean the memorial. This has been moulded from code stone, which my lovely friend from History of Stark, Philippa, told me all about. This is a stone that was 
invented by this really cool woman. So do check out Codestone. It's thought this statue was made in 1802, uh, and it depicts Sabrina in a grotto that was originally decorated with shells, coral and gems. We are dismayed this has happened, said a National Trust spokesperson, which is such a delightfully National Trust. We are dismayed. <laughs> Sip my tea, eat my scone. We are dismayed this has happened. Um, they added, disappointing as they are, incidents like this are very rare, considering the millions of visitors who enjoy and respect the places in our care. That is the most National Trust response. Work to remove the crayon marks from the Lancelot Capability Brown Memorial are ongoing. His work landscaping the grounds is thought to have been his first large commission. We are, I think there is, um, there's a lot of people in the comments assuming that this is a child. I'm inclined to lean in that this is, that a kid has, this is a, a child has done this because it's a crayon and we are looking at this being maybe the Easter holidays, depending on what, on what school they're from or maybe daycare. The, the question is, why weren't they stopped? Well, because if my kid gets hold of a crayon and walks towards my wall, he doesn't get far. He doesn't get far. And a child, we're assuming it's a child. I kind of hope it was, but I... <laughs> Zoomed on the picture, Timmy was here. We're assuming it's a child. And in some ways, I sort of hope it was, but that also makes me think, firstly... Why, how is it allowed to get to this level? Secondly, if your kid does it and you you find them afterwards, you tell a, you tell a, someone who's in charge, you tell somebody who is working on that site um, and you apologise profusely that this has happened. Magic Erasers, I'm not sponsored. Alex, apps, I love the Magic Eraser. I buy one whenever, whenever I'm coming close to running out, I buy one. They are phenomenal. They are wonderful. <laughs> this is this is this is this is where censorship gets you. This is what happens. <laughs> this is what happens. You come over. It's not a red pen. You come over with a blue crayon and colour in the nipples because blue nipples <laughs> are so much less offensive. You're thinking teenagers. See, the thing is, I just I think a teenager would have a Sharpie. I don't know many, I'll be honest with you, I don't know many teenagers that have ready access to crayons. That's not that's not a thing. I mean, maybe it's a teenager. Regardless, let's hope it gets cleaned and it doesn't cost too much to do so. Our last piece of new news. We have Spanish police on the forgery trail. They have seized, we are told five fake Goya and Velasquez paintings supposedly worth a collective $84 million. These are um, old master forgeries that were being sold for a collective 76 million euros or $84 million. They were being marketed as the work of Francisco Goya, four were, and a fifth um, by Diego Velasquez. Investigators got wind of these paintings earlier the year, this year when sellers were offering them to a number of art dealers. They were confiscated um, on two separate raids in the coast city of Valencia. Four suspects are being investigated. They have been interviewed but not arrested. Um, the sellers had also produced faked provenance documents in the hopes of fooling potential collectors into believing that these were the genuine article. Quote, the most important thing about this crime is that it devalues the work of our creative people. In this case, the great painters of history, Gabriela Bravo, head of the regional government's Justice Department, said in a, state, in a statement, noting that art forgery is the fourth most lucrative type of crime in Spain after drugs, weapons and sex work. Manuela Mena, a Goya specialist, and uh, David Gimillo, an art technician at the Museo de Bellas Artes in Valencia, have both confirmed the works were forgeries, but it doesn't seem like it was that difficult to tell. The prices of the work was a copy of Velasquez's portrait of Mariana of Austria. 
the composition was cropped to show only her face. The full-length portrait of the original was painted for the Spanish royal family, and it's famously in the collection of the Museo del Prado in Madrid. The two of the Goyas were also copies of works at the Prado, but by the 18th century German artist Anton Rafael Menges. Each were priced at 7 million euros or 7.7 million dollars. Can I? I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure what. I don't know if I have sufficient hair in my house <laughs> to do whatever is go. It's like taste the rainbow. <laughs> That's. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. All of these forgeries are believed to have originated with the same owner, a Valencia collector who died in 2020. But these new identified fakes, quite fun, are going to join a display. According to the Spanish news outlet, this um, display is titled False, the Art of Deception or Art Deception. It opened last month and it's going to run through to September the 3rd. I think that's really cool. And what a great way to earn some legitimate money from these forgeries to put them into an exhibition that's going to earn money for a museum. If you are going to be able to go to this exhibition, do let us know what you think. Uh, and also, the exhibition guide is worth looking at. Well, friends, it's come to that time. I'm ringing my ding-dong bell. My little peeing boy with his little wee willy winkies out. Time for a ding-dong. Here we go. Ding dong. Hollister residents have called for the removal of a rock sculpture that resembles a phallic symbol. Look, right. Here's what I'm going to say. If you hadn't... Now you point it out to me, do I see how that does in fact look like a penis and testicles? Now you've pointed out, I can, I can definitely see it. I can definitely see it. But if you hadn't pointed it out to me, I would have been like, that's a rock. I would not. <laughs> Look, everything can be a deal if you're brave enough, but I would not, 10 out of 10 would not recommend <laughs> giving that a go because that's a trip to A&E and no one's going to believe that you tripped and fell. I, do you know what? You think so. I thought so. I, I thought, apparently... Some residents in Hollister are calling for the removal of a 30-year-old rock sculpture they describe to resemble a phallic symbol. It's located in the front of the country administrative building and they have been calling for a change of the sculpture for years. Look, it's not massively attractive. You could probably put something better there, but don't get rid of it because it, it, if you if you squint and close one eye, it looks kind of like a wang. It's an eight-foot stone sculpture. It happens to look like a penis. <laughs> I will not tolerate that message from my county government, said Cheryl Van Booth, a Hollister re resident. Okay. That, if, that, if that's the hill you want to die on, Cheryl, crack on, sweetheart. Um, <laughs> my husband's asking for crayons. No crayons for you, James. The artist in question, Richard Douche, no, Dutch, Deutsch, Richard Deutsch, <laughs> Richard Deutsch, presented the board to the board on Tuesday. He said that the Pinnacles National Monument was his inspiration. I don't know what that is. Quote, so what I did was I chose some of the formations as being a centre point for the project in front of your county building. Some concerned residents are calling the statue offensive. It's been there thirty. It's been there thirty years. Okay. Um, quote: This is a phallic symbol. It's very uncomfortable to walk into this building. Not every in this building apparently sees it this way, but there are some that feel offended to walk into the building for having a phallic symbol. I feel that this board needs to be sensitive of public sentiment. That sentiment has been there for a long, long time since it was put up there. 
However, some are calling the uproar a waste of time. I find this insanely juvenile that we're talking about a stack of rocks. They should not be taking up this much time and energy. <laughs> uh, the San Benito County Board of Supervisors also at odds with the sculpture. I just don't know if um, in front of our county building this actually makes much sense. In some ways, it's a bit tasteless. It Okay. Um, it's just the nature of art. Not every piece is going to be university like by everyone, and that's okay. A three to two majority of the board decided to develop a committee to look further into the matter. The committee will look at the cost of moving the statue as well as possibly placing a plaque in front of the statue to clearly explain its meaning. Ironically and comically, the vote to do something about it was three to two. Three women voted to figure out what we can do about it, and two men voted against it. The county estimates the cost to remove the artwork to be anywhere between $20,000 to $50,000. One resident presented the idea of possibly auctioning the piece and giving the money to the county's arts council. Moving it would cost up, up to $50,000. Is this one of the places where teachers are having to buy paper for their classrooms out of their own money? It is time. To just <laughs> I mean just just if it if if it offends you, look away. Look it's 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 literally it's not an actual erect penis. It's not an actual erect penis. It's three rocks, one top of another. Just, dear God, if rocks on top of each other are that offensive, if they came to Stonehenge, they would have a conniption. I mean, Cleopatra's needle will do them nothing. Dear, oh dear. Sticking with Ding Dong, I got sent this meme, which I enjoy. Put these on, the Americans are coming. <laughs> Quickly, wife runs for the wee willy winky. <laughs> Oh boy. Um, and with that, I'm going to actually, we're not doing a ding dong, but I'm going to move on to a the, the events and exhibitions. We're starting with a book and I feel like it's fitting. A book launch is coming out. Museum bums, a cheeky look at butts in hardcover, um, butts in art. I think that looks fabulous. Um, do check that out. <laughs> New book. Um, we have... This in a museum that is near Turin in Italy, we have an exhibition, Tapestries and Ceremonies at the Papal Court. The exhibition is entitled In Leonardo's Shadow. This opened on the 21st of March and it's running to the 18th of June 2023. So not massively long to go and see it. But if you are near Turin between now and the 18th of June, go check it out. I think it might be fun thing to go and see and um as i said accessibility information is linked in both the description box and also on the upper pin board but this was available for here next up we're back to colonial williamsburg and this is something for the future future they are have announced they are going to be breaking ground on a new archaeology center what is the opposite of phallic I'm going to look that up. I'm going to look that up. I don't know. What is the opposite of phallic? That's an excellent, that's an excellent question. What is, if anybody, can somebody quickly do the antonym of phallic? Can you Google it? Antonym of phallic. Um, Yonic, I thought it might be. Yonic, Yonic. Yonic. Very good. Yonic. Lovely. So, um, Colonel Williamsburg is going to break ground on a new archaeology centre. This is going to be named the Colin G. and Nancy N. Campbell Archaeological Centre. And it's going to be built across from the art museums next to Custis Square. 
it's significant for the foundation, we're told, as they are getting ready to commemorate America's 250th anniversary in 2026. Julesy, fabulous. Alas, poor Yonick. I knew him well. Or her, rather. I knew her, Horatio. <laughs> Spectacular. Although the foundation has received uh, gifts from donors. Funding is needed to complete this project. The centre's targeted opening date is 2025. Groundbreaking begins April 21st. So in four days. Yes, that's how maths works. Four days. This is an online event which is being streamed from either Los Angeles or New York. Um, but I'm assuming it's available elsewhere also. the This is an online event with Laura Morelli. She's an art historian and also a novelist. The title of the event is Hide, Steal and Loot, Art Crimes of World War II. So I th think that could be a very interesting thing to do. That is... That is the time zone. So it's 4 p.m. and it'll be 4 p.m. in L.A., 7 p.m. in New York. I'm assuming that she's in one of those locations. I don't know which one. And I also don't know what that means for if you are elsewhere in the world. So Google those things if you would like to join in. It may, of course, tell you if you book tickets. It looks pretty fun to me. We have got uh, an exhibition in New York at The Rubin, a gallery we haven't spoken about before. Death is Not the End, an exhibition that opened on March the 17th and will be going through until January the 14th, 2024. I think this looks absolutely fabulous and definitely worth checking out all of these pieces of art, Memento Mori, fabulous. And last, by no means least, we have a exhibition at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art entitled Splendid Land, the Paintings from Royal Udapur. This uh, opened in 2022, November the 19th, and it's running until May the 14th, 2023. So we have very little time left if you want to check that out. And you are going to have to get to Washington, D.C. or be in Washington, D.C this is art from around 1700 these are works that have an emphasis on lived experience and constitute a new direction in indian painting these are pa on paper and cloth many on public view for the first time the exhibition reveals the environmental political and emotional context in which this new genre emerged called a splendid land it explores the unique visual strategies that artists develop to communicate emotions to depict places and to celebrate water resources additionally if you do miss this one as it is closing fairly soon just at the bottom here that this exhibition is going to be traveling and it's going to be at the cleveland museum of art from summer 2023 when i know when that closes as well i will of course link that information so as i have said previously all of this information is linked in the description box and also it's tagged in the opera pin board we have been going for nearly three hours. I'm quite tired and it's time for me to have some dinner. I has who had some drinks? It's not me because I don't drink alcohol. I've only got tea in my mug. So uh, not me. And I will never have drinks. I am. I am just I'm just like that. Um, that's. Uh, <laughs> that's who I am. So please do make sure you are subscribed to the channel. Please do like this video. Thank you for commenting in the live. Please also comment if you can in the comment section of this so it helps to boost it for the playback. You can either put a chat in the comment section or you can do one of our little social glyphs. I will let you pick what, what news item most caught your fancy today and what is the social glyph that relates to it and I will see if I can figure out what you are talking about um, when I have a look at them. So thus thank you all have a wonderful Monday whatever time of day it is for you over there and 
if it's evening, but I hope you're going to have a wonderful rest of your week. I will see hopefully many of you on Friday when we sit down to have our live chat as part of the premiere of the pre-recorded video. Thank you all so much for taking the time and spending this time with me. I look forward to speaking to you all, all in my next video. But for now, please do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.